health data and healthcare delivery. Today's event will showcase the resulting products, and we can't wait for you to see the impressive work that was done in this sprint. Now, to help set the stage for all of today's presenters, I'd like to introduce our two welcome speakers representing our host agencies, the U.S. Census Bureau and FDA. First, we will hear from Drew Zachary. Zachary, Deputy Chief Innovation Officer and Managing Director of Census Open Innovation Labs. Then we will hear from Dr. Sarah Brenner, Associate Director for Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer for In Vitro Diagnostics at FDA. First, over to you, Drew. Thank you so much, Haley, and hi, everyone. I'm Drew, and on behalf of the Census Bureau, welcome, and thank you for tuning in today. I'm a proud co-founder of TOP, and I have to say it's incredible to see how much this program has grown since its early days as just a staff idea at the White House in 2016. Part of what helped this effort thrive is a collaboration across agencies. Our community grew as more people learned how they could use TOP as an approach to bring people together and rapidly solve problems. And now I would say we have a very enthusiastic network across government who turn to TOP whenever they have a tricky data problem to solve. We've partnered with agencies, including the Department of Transportation, Education, Housing and Urban Development, Labor, and more than a dozen others. Um, and this has also been tremendously helpful because data can't be useful when it's in silos. We really see the power of open data when it's brought together across agencies, across levels of government, and across sectors. In the top team, we are firm believers that government can't and shouldn't try to solve huge problems alone, and that we really need the support and perspectives of the tech industry and individuals who are directly affected by problems to create great solutions. You'll see that in all of our sessions today. Everyone has a unique skill set or perspective to contribute, and the magic happens when we bring it all together. As an open innovation team, we are always learning from outside collaborators, and that is never more true than with our partners at HHS. Our collaboration with them over the years has been a very exciting one and has yielded so many innovations. The TopX toolkit itself, the digital toolkit that lays out every step of our process, was catalyzed by our colleague Kristen Honey at HHS, who you'll hear a keynote from shortly. The idea that top sprints could not only use data, but also generate new data and help with data standards adoption also came out of a top health sprint in 2021. And that same 2021 sprint was also the first one in which we opened milestone sessions to anyone in the public so that the process was truly 100% transparent. This was an idea from HHS based on the need for true openness and transparency in health policy. Our HHS Sprint leaders, as you'll see today, are so hands-on and bring an incredible amount of knowledge to the table, many of them both MDs and policy experts, and we're grateful that they both value the top process and Census Bureau data to help serve their mission to the public. We're thrilled to see each year how engaged the health technology community is outside of government and how many stakeholders come to the table to help solve these problems. And I can't wait to unveil the products that the Sprint participants created in response to these calls to action. And now I'm honored to introduce my wonderful colleague, Dr. Sarah Brenner, who was the mastermind behind the Sprint from the very beginning to provide a welcome from FDA. Sarah is a preventive medicine and public health physician serving as the chief medical officer for in vitro diagnostics and associate director for medical affairs in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at FDA. In that role, she advises leadership on regulatory pre-market and post-market compliance and surveillance, as well as broader initiatives to promote and protect public health. Since November 2021, Dr. Brenner has been building a new first of its kind diagnostic data program that we'll hear more about today. Over to you, Sarah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Drew, for that warm welcome and allowing me to kick off this great showcase event with everyone today. Um, we've been looking forward to this for months, so I'm I'm very excited. Um, but I'm going to be brief because you don't want to hear me talk. You want to get to the good stuff. 
Um, I'll just mention a couple of things. Uh, this is not our first rodeo with top, as was mentioned, and the census team is fabulous to work with. I think my engagements with top started back in like 18 or 19 when we did a sprint to address the opioid crisis. And um, so public health and innovation, uh, along with regulation now, have been near and dear to my heart for many years. We did, for those who've been along for the COVID ride with um, the FDA diagnostics team, we also did a design-a-thon. Uh, we did a previous top sprint, and now this is our culminating event, bringing you the best of the best over the last several years to um, showcase different technologies to address the gaps and needs that we've identified and take a look forward at how these types of digital diagnostic technologies can serve patients on an individual level for a variety of purposes beyond infectious diseases moving forward. Um, so with regard to the sprints, the the way that the problem statements were laid out were really um, iterated on for a, quite a while, as I mentioned, through previous sprints. And we also thought um, and tracked along with different companies and different private sector and other stakeholders who we'd been working with over the course of many years to really drill down on, you know, where can we bring folks together to take a look forward into the future? And where do we see the greatest opportunities for collaboration around new and emerging technologies, the genies that got out of the bottle during the pandemic, we'll say, and how can we harness those um, to be most impactful for patients moving forward? So the, um, the, the, Focus areas that Haley mentioned and that you'll hear more about today include capturing harmonized data, um, advancing aggregation of data, and the use of IVDs in telehealth and extended distributed healthcare models. So these are exciting areas. Um, and I'm not going to steal anyone's thunder. So you, those are out there. We've given them a lot of thought and you'll hear where people are, are thinking and looking to go today. The last thing I'll, I'll sort of iterate on a bit here is why is this important to FDA? So uh, when you think of innovation and you think of dynamic sprints and you think of moving really fast to bring technologies to the forefront, you might not think of FDA first. Okay, fair. <laughs> um, but we actually have a really important role at the table with regards to innovation. You can't... Um, regulate technologies well if you don't understand where technology is, what it can and can't do, and where it's going. And so for me, innovation regulation are really like yin and yang. And so we've tried to lean in and be very proactive with regards to understanding where technologies are now, where they are going, the type of evidence and data that needs to be generated to demonstrate uh, the performance, effectiveness, and safety of different medical products that we regulate. And diagnostics has been um, an, a very, very interesting, to say the least, um, landscape in that regard over the last few years. Um, so FDA's interests, of course, are in ensuring that tests work so that they're high quality, high performing tests. We're also interested in not just does a test work based on the empirical evidence that's submitted as part of a submission to FDA, but for what purpose is it best fit? And different testing technologies, as we learned during COVID, are better used in different scenarios. There are limitations to different types of technologies, and there are um, sort of sweet spots and ways that they can be used at the individual and population level. So it's important to understand that landscape when we're thinking about both innovation and regulation. Um, and the other thing that FDA brings to the table in these discussions is we are keenly aware of how underlying technologies work, what they can do, what the potential um, is with different tech, and what they cannot do, what their limitations are. And so we have obviously seen a whole lot of things <laughs> through, through fulfilling our mission to regulate medical products. And so we bring a unique perspective um, in that regard with, with um thinking towards the future and how we can best help patients and populations with testing technologies. I have a great team. And as was mentioned, um, the diagnostic data program that we launched uh, a couple of years ago now is in full swing. We have a lot of awesome collaborators across the interagency and across a broad stakeholder group. Um, and we have incredible FDA staff that have been recruited to help run the program as well as run this sprint. So without further ado, I will turn it over um, to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Kristen Honey. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and, uh, let's see, I can just do a self-introduction. Um, and so, yeah, I'm Dr. Kristen Honey, and I am the Chief Data Scientist for the Office of Science and Medicine in the HHS Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health, 
which is at HHS headquarters in Washington, D.C., and we're charged with the public health authorities, which were really important in COVID times, and a close collaborator of Sarah and FDA. But anything public health kind of runs through OASH as a, as a coordinator, a collaborator, a convening function. Um, we like to think of ourselves kind of as a connective tissue of HHS health initiatives. My team is a scrappy but small team called Innovation X, and we run partnerships, um, human-centered design, um, open innovation like crowdsourcing, citizen science, um, prizes, and um, grand challenges. And then uh, the favorite, which is most related to top and top X here, is open data fueling innovation. So open data is a great fuel for new businesses, uh, new entrepreneurship, uh, uh, new accelerating scientific uh, breakthroughs, uh, collaboration. And so open data as a fuel is the foundation for top. And my team does a lot of that. Um, so how we got involved with top is a long story that predates even Innovation X, the team I run now. Um, it comes out of the Obama White House. And Drew Zachary, uh, now at the Census Bureau, was uh, leading work with the, the Domestic Policy Council. And I was working in OSTP, serving the U.S. Chief Technology Officer. OSTP is the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And we all kind of realized, like, open data is great. Open data is wonderful. Fuel, scaling solutions with, with data standards, all the things you are all doing in this sprint. And hackathons and getting people together for civic tech is also wonderful. But one thing we observe is that the momentum can sometimes stop. You have a hackathon, an event, a meetup, a data jam. New people, new teams, new disciplines collide in innovative ways. But where does the momentum go after that? So we thought, um, you know, is there a way we could have long engagement and transform federal data into digital tools or other you know, um, digital assets and real world impact through a three or four month uh, in sprint where we at HHS, uh, sorry, at then it is at the White House, provide the lightweight framework and work with federal government and data stewards to unlock the data or share the data standards and provide, you know, uh, answer questions from entrepreneurs on the outside to, who will on the outside transform that data into real world. So it was a pilot. We didn't know if it would work. It was a resounding success. And then the Census Bureau, which has incredible data, seemed like a logical permanent home after this idea of top was piloted. So that was where it began. Uh, and it's been at the Census Bureau, I think, since 2016, early on, maybe 2017. But back in 2018, after a couple years, and I don't know how many sprints, but dozens and dozens of teams, high impact returns, we thought, is there a way that we can um, uh, make this self-sufficient for agencies? And we were wondering that at HHS, because we at HHS, Health and Human Services, wanted to run sprints um, in addition to what the Census Bureau was doing. So we partnered with the Presidential Innovation Fellows, PIFs, if there are any PIFs out there, thank you, and piloted with the Census Bureau um, was now the TOPX toolkit and said, can the Census Bureau just give an agency, here's our how-to guide, and then they can transform open data into uh, real world value using this top model. And again, it worked incredibly well. And that 2018, 2019 sprint, in addition to working with the Presidential Innovation Fellows, was in collaboration with NIH and the National Cancer Institute. And we had two tracks. We had one track for using artificial intelligence to improve cancer clinical trials and patient matching. And then the other track was for uh, Lyme disease and tick-borne illness. And how can we transform uh, data and emerging technologies to move the needle online? And that turned into such success that then it became the TopX toolkit. And then HHS wanted to do this all over again. So in COVID times, many of you are here today to help participate in this. We did a design-a-thon in 2020, put out a call to action on a crowdsourcing platform, which is waters.crowdicity.com, um, to basically say, what are your ideas uh, to help us ingest non-laboratory diagnostic data, harmonize that, and then transform that data into understanding and help uh, public officials at HHS and other places um, use that data to make real-time decisions? So with that design-a-thon, we had um, almost 1,000 different people engaged and I think over 30 submissions, uh, many, many uh, uh, teams submitted incredible solutions for this challenge. And then uh, judges picked 15 winners, and we also had crowdsourcing voting and the People's Choice elected a winner. 
So 16 teams went on with, uh, with us in 2021 to do a full tech sprint, although it was a consol consolidated accelerated top X sprint for COVID-19 at anywhere diagnostic sprint. And um, of those teams, some of them merged. And out of those 16 teams, uh, I believe 13, 12 or 13 digital tools launched. So the few of the teams combined. And I want to give a special shout out to four teams that came back again. And they not only finished and helped win the, uh, the 2021 COVID-19 at Anywhere Diagnostics Designathon, but are here today and going to unveil their tools and can't wait to see them. But Interpret DNA, thanks for coming back around. Uh, Safe Health Systems, kudos to you twice now. Allison Martin from Requero Health, which was back in 2021, you do health, and they've been required, uh, acquired by Requero. So congrats on growing the business and launching yet another digital tool through this sprint. And then last but not least, Rod Francisilla from Guidehouse, and Guidehouse was uh, formerly part of um, Double Technologies. And all of you have been so incredibly important for helping the government and the whole of government really a whole of society response, uh, transform COVID laboratory data into uh, understanding and into um, a, an improved pandemic response. So thank you for your continued efforts. I can't wait to see the next round of digital tools that you'll unveil today. And then um, I'll just end with, we do have more top and top X momentum to come. We're super excited in this next year coming up. In 2024, in collaboration with HHS and many other partners, we hope to continue this work in the next generation diagnostic space. And we also are going to increasingly lean into long COVID. So if any of your diagnostic tools or inflammatory markers for long COVID, we are going to have a future top sprint for you. Uh, there's also before that going to be a healthathon where we open it up to crowdsourcing ideas. To, it's, it's more uh, going to be broader than only diagnostics, but about how do we help long COVID patients today and how do we help uh, not just uh, uh, better diagnose them, but better treat them, better connect them to services. So this top model will be used for other things, not only next generation diagnostics to come, but also long COVID and these complex, often invisible, infection-associated chronic illnesses where Americans, you know, really uh, are, are ill, but we don't yet have definitive diagnostics to, to, um, to know how you best to treat that. So we're leaning in big on the long COVID space, excited for future innovation sprints, data sprints, and top sprints to come. And the last thing I'll say uh, in motivation for teams and all that, is that we in government are here to serve you. So as you're building your digital tools and moving through or engage with us on future tech sprints, please let us know how we can help you. Government is made of individuals and through top, we're demystifying how government works. You can pull back the curtain and know that it's Sarah Brenner at FDA, it's Kristen Honey at HHS headquarters, it's all these data stewards who are there and can answer your questions. And we can have a two-way dialogue. And your questions can help us uh, unlock, you know, high-priority data assets. Um, and we can, we can uh, have that dialogue back and forth. So if you need anything from us, please do not hesitate to ask. We're all here to serve you. And uh, these solutions, uh, open innovation, top, top sprints, they truly are a team sport. So congratulations to all the top teams who are, who are uh, launching their tools today. Super excited to see all 13 of them um, and uh, uh, this whole of uh, government response to COVID and the next generation of diagnostics is vastly improved and will all succeed because of your industry and academic contributions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that fantastic keynote. We are inspired by your words and encourage everyone to follow along with the work that you are doing at Innovation X. Over the next three hours, you'll hear speakers, product demos, and reactions that we hope will inform and inspire you. We'll feature experts from industry and government to share exciting and upcoming work. Today's showcase will include demos of 13 of the new products created in this year's top FDA sprint. We'll also hear from some of the amazing 
amazing sprint participants who work in public health, research, and patient advocacy to share their candid feedback on how their communities could use these products and what next steps are ahead for them to truly make an impact. Before we dive in further, let's cover a bit of housekeeping. If you'd like to stay in touch with our team and get updates on how to get involved, please make sure to go to opportunity.census.gov and sign up for our mailing list. We will post the link in the YouTube chat. We hope that you'll also post your thoughts, reactions, and questions throughout the event in the YouTube chat. Please share what you're learning and your reactions throughout the afternoon via social media using hashtag Opportunity Project, and please tag at U.S. Census Bureau and at U.S. underscore FDA. Now, let's kick off the product demos. We'd like to explain a few key roles in the top sprint process that you'll continue to hear throughout the day. Sprint leaders are the people from government agencies who helped organize and lead this year's sprints. Tech teams are the companies, nonprofits, and universities who build digital tools. User advocates are the community organizations and people with lived experience who work with the tech teams to make sure the products are useful to real people. Data stewards are government agency representatives who help connect the teams with the data. And finally, product advisors help to make sure these new tools get out into real users' hands and have a sound product strategy. Now, let's dive into our first session of the day and the first set of product demos. One of these challenges that the teams tackled in the sprint was capturing data from in vitro diagnostics or IVDs. Testing provides critical data for the healthcare ecosystem, but with new at anywhere non-lab based tests, think test done at home or done over the counter, capturing the data for use in public health and healthcare becomes a challenge. These tests are not processed in a traditional lab setting, but the data still needs to be captured in a uniform format and trans transmitted from the test itself to a healthcare provider or public health institution. In the sprint, we challenge teams to create tools that improve the capture and transmission of data from testing devices while aligning with best practice data standards. Ultimately, these efforts aim to significantly improve patient care and enhance public health decision making. To help introduce why this challenge is so important, we'll hear from Dr. Sammy Begg, digital health subject matter expert at FDA's Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and the Office of Product evaluation and quality. He is one of the FDA sprint leaders who brought this sprint to life over the past year. Welcome, Sammy. Thank you, Haley, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here and join you as we uh, wait for the sprint, uh, uh, the tech demos. Uh, this has been an exciting process over the last uh, about eight uh, to nine months. And thanks to the participation of everyone in this uh, sprint, it is the largest uh, sprint in the seven plus history of top. Uh, so we're excited for that and excited to showcase uh, the tech teams and their products. Uh, my background, I'm a physician uh, trained in preventive medicine and um, uh, with work in population health, uh, corporate wellness and digital health. Uh, we came up with the problem statement that you saw that these teams tackle based on a collaborative back and forth with different, um, you know, parts of the U.S. government from the ONC to NIH and CDC with the goal of creating problems that uh, uh, the solutions that dealt with uh, current problems and gaps that we have seen. As we are very familiar with uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic that resulted in uh, uh, lab tests, but those lab tests could only go so far and we soon had to move to at-home testing. Uh, at-home testing requires a lot of, um, you know, uh, work from the patient, but as part of that process, unfortunately, we are unable to collect that data so that it is utilized for decision making. As you know, uh, we all have probably gone through this. You know, we take the test, make a personal decision whether to go to school, go to work, and then we throw the test away. So the goal is to capture the test and make it um, useful for decision making. And that is the entire uh, purpose of the initial uh, problem statement. But as you'll hear from others later on, part of the, the goal of other problem statements was to take that into a step further and look at things such as aggregating data to ensure that other data elements are also captured for the best decision making. And lastly, 
you know, the data can only go so far unless we're using the data to make certain decisions, even from a clinical standpoint. So the last uh, one you'll hear about is about test to treat and what can be done with that. So I'm excited to, uh, you know, welcome you all and excited to be here uh, as we uh, begin uh, this sprint and um, sprint demos. And you'll be excited uh, to find out about the great products that everyone has created. With that, I'll hand it back over to Haley uh, so she can get the demo started. Thank you so much, Sammy. And now let's just dive straight in to hear from the teams who built products in response to this challenge. Thank you, Haley. My name is Thera Neyman, and I am the Innovation Program Manager at Census Open Innovation Labs. In this segment, we'll hear from three teams that built data-driven digital products to better capture data from IBDs. While you're watching each of the tech teams present their products, we'll post links to the products in the YouTube live stream chat so that you can access them directly. Some of the presenting team members may be active in the chat to post their contact info and answer questions, so please feel free to engage there. To begin this segment of Lightning Talks, we'll hear from Josh from Community Connect Labs. Take it away, Josh. Hi, I'm Josh Levitan from Community Connect Labs. A little bit about us. We are a nonprofit. We work exclusively with government and other nonprofits to help underserved populations do things like manage their health, and enjoy benefits, basically leveraging digital technologies to make things easier on those folks. The problem that we're working on is how do you get people to self-report COVID-19 test results even when they're negative? The data source that we're using is the COVID-19 case surveillance data with geography. And a survey that we did uh, for general populations about self-reporting had about 50-50 split for people who did not uh, report their tests versus report them. And the reasons that were given, um, difficulty, privacy, et cetera, and the main other reason being people didn't report negative results because they didn't know that they needed to report that. So that's something that everybody needs to be educated about. The target audience that we're specifically working with is Hispanic immigrants in the East Palo Alto area. We're partnering with Nuestra Casa de East Palo Alto, which is a promotorist model. That's community health workers. Uh, we have a lot of experience in this particular space. Our office is based in the Bay Area. And the very first uh, work that we ever did was a digital divide survey in San Jose for um, Hispanic communities. Uh, and specifically highlighting some of the gaps in broadband access and computer access and help the city get uh, $24 million in funding to unlock uh, additional broadband there. So it's an audience we're very uh, comfortable with and work with in the past. Our user journey is really simple. We text out to members of this audience and we say, hey, you should report your results. And if they have any questions, they can ask them and get them answered. And then if they're ready to report, they can report over SMS. And then via API, we kick that out uh, to report stream to get reported back on. So this is an example of our platform. Um, this is an SMS flow. I'm demoing it in English. It will be in Spanish. Uh, we're sending this out to members and we're giving them a $5 gift card to uh, do the exercise and then give us some feedback on it so that we can improve it. So hi, their name would be stubbed in here. Did you know that reporting your COVID-19 test results is a great way to keep your community in East Palo Alto safe? And they can reply, yes, if they're ready to go. What about my data? What about my privacy? Or even if I'm negative? And you can respond with either the letter or words. I'm gonna say, what about my data? The only data we need is your test result, positive or negative in your zip code, that's it. Nothing is tied to your personal information and you can't be identified in any way. Are you ready to report? If so, reply report. And then is your test negative? And then what's your zip code? And then we say, thanks for reporting and doing your part to keep the community safe. If you'd like to see data, you can visit this dashboard here. Uh, I'll give one more. Quick example here, even if I'm negative. A negative test result's important. It lets us know how quickly the disease is spreading in your specific zip code. And again, you have the option to report. So we want to address people's concerns about their data or their privacy and educate them why they want to report even if they're negative and everything is tied to specifically their community, keeping their community safe, making sure that they're counted. 
Next steps for us would be to pilot launch this and get the feedback on the survey and then update and revise that as needed. Uh, we're working on getting reporting access to report stream so that we can uh, do that via Fire API directly uh, to the CDC. And then we're figuring out automated triggers. So can we monitor the case data in the East Palo Alto area and automatically send out messages to this population when case counts are above X percent? Thank you. Thanks so much, Josh. We really appreciate your partnership with community health workers and your attention to the specific needs of the East Palo Alto community. This is a great tool and we're sure it'll help a lot of people. Next, we'll hear from Palantir. Shoshana, the virtual floor is yours. Hi, everybody. I'm Shoshana. I'm with the Palantir team. And for today's lightning sprint, I will walk you through our solution on mapping fire to OMOP data. So in our agenda today, let's first walk through the problem that we identified before going into our solution and how it impacts our end users. And then we'll dive into some initial work before going into a quick demo. So why do we need to map this fire to OMOP data? Imagine you're an FDA reviewer trying to analyze electronic healthcare data. And two types of models you might want to use are fire and OMOP data. However, these are used for two very different things. So there's a really big lexical gap when trying to translate between the two. Um, so this means a lot of data is lost along the way. So in order to empower these FDA reviewers, public health institutions, research institutions to make public health decision making and perform analysis, we need a way to empower these reviewers to map between FHIR and OMOP data models. And not only just map between them, but to introduce version control, to introduce peer review, and to use LLMs to make this process a little easier along the way so that we can create a standardized set of mappings that can be shared with other public health agencies, EHR systems, and health research organizations. So going into some initial work, these are two screenshots taken from Palantir Foundry. So the one on the left shows a data pipeline built within a no-code tool called Pipeline Builder. So in this pipeline, we take our raw fire data and perform several data cleaning and transformation operations to get it into a clean state. And then on the right, we take that clean data, turn it into several different OMOP tables. And from those tables, we can extract out a few different objects to put within the foundry ontology. So what this means is these objects make these tables a little more human readable. And we can also perform actions on these objects within um, applications within foundry. And we need to perform actions on these. Remember, there's no pre-existing dictionary defining fire to OMOP translation. So we need an application that does this for us, which brings us to our mapping inbox demo. So this is the mapping inbox we created. On the left, we have a column of all the OMOP columns that need to be mapped to fire attributes. If we click on one, it populates a list on the right of the fire attributes we can map it to. Um, normally, we just click one and create the mapping. But this is a concept, which means it needs to map to a specific code within the Athena database. This database is huge. It has millions of entries. So to make this a little easier, we look to using large language models and semantic search. So this is an AIP-enabled feature. And what this does is it uh, breaks down the actual context of the user's query and finds the most similar results within the Athena database. So here we use semantic search to get some good uh, concepts that we can use and make this a little easier on the subject matter, matter expert performing the mapping. So let's go ahead and create our new mapping. And this is where we introduce our peer review. Again, we want this to become a standardized and accurate set of mappings. So we need to perform some checks on it. So let's say my peer goes ahead and confirms it. This is where we introduce version control. So every time we create a new mapping, it creates a new version within the system. And these are versions are really important for grouping and testing different groupings and mappings, and maybe even having different groupings and mappings for different use cases. So once a standardized version and accurate version of mappings is created, we can go ahead and put it into production. So this would involve updating the active version here and setting it to true. And we can use this handy tool to do it. So this takes our active version and applies it to a table within Foundry. And I'll go to that in a second. And in the table, you can see that our mappings were successfully applied. 
And this is just one example of a table within Foundry, but this table, along with the mappings, can be exported and used anywhere else. So throughout this example, what we saw was creating mappings, how we can use semantic search and LLMs to make this a little easier, reviewing the mappings, versioning them. And then we talked a little bit about how this resulting data can be shared and how the resulting mappings can be used and shared across institutions. Um, this concludes my lightning talk. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks so much, Shoshana. And congratulations to the whole Palantir team for this important project, bridging the lexical gap between these two data models. Finally, we'll hear from the Interpret DNA team. Over to you, Interpret DNA. Hello and welcome. Today, I would like you to introduce you to Interpret DNA's digital health platform, MyHealthVault. Our Web3 platform is designed specifically for consumers so that they can test, store, and report their at-home test data anonymously. We also wanted to give the consumers full ownership of their health data so that they have control of who they share it with. Our platform is also designed to be nimble and flexible so that it can be deployed by several stakeholders within the healthcare system. Our app can be designed, deployed by healthcare agencies, community healthcare agencies to track dis disease prevalence, it can be deployed by test developers for collecting post-market data for FDA approval. Yet another version can be deployed by schools, public health organizations, or private organizations to track students or employees to provide clinical assistance when needed. I'm going to drive into the product now. I'm going to show you the consumer experience. We built this to be a mobile accessible application and access the app either anonymously or by using a Web3 wallet. Here, I'm going to use MetaMask it, uh, to log in, but it can work with any Web3 authentication provider. This preserves the user's anonymity. Now I'm going to go in and find a survey to, for a test that I have taken. What I'm going to do here is try to scan the QR code in the box of the test. The QR code in the box corresponds to the UDI of the test, and each individual test has a unique code. Our app then looks up the UDI code in FDA's Global Unique Device Identification Database. This verifies that the test is an FDA-approved, valid, and unexpired test. This also makes sure that the same UDI cannot be used for an app in the app again. Notice that we did all this verification without involving any PPI data from the consumer. The app found that this was the Abbott real-time SAS assay survey, so now I can go take the test. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here where it shows that I've completed the survey and I've got a reward. And this reward was given to me by the manufacturer without requiring any PPI data from me. It also has the history of, the, of my survey submission, shows that when I took the survey and the reward that I've got. I'm going to dive into the manufacturer's experience now. I'm going to pretend to log in as an administrator from Abbott. And uh, I access this dashboard where it shows uh, all the survey submissions that I've had. I can download the data. And if I want to change a survey, I can click Edit Survey here and change any attribute of the survey, including questions, answers, uh, grouping, any text can be changed. And similarly, I can go ahead and create a new test too. And here it shows the reward frequency, which shows how many how many times I want to reward people when they take the uh, take when they submit a survey. So that's completely configurable. Thank you for watching this demo video. Amazing, Saromi and Hamansu. Thank you for your hard work on this platform. The attention to security is fantastic, and we're eager to see how it's adopted. I'll also add that we are happy to have you participate in another top sprint. We'd also like to give a shout out here to the four teams of talented General Assembly graduates who tackled this challenge. The General Assembly teams used federal open data to create apps for reporting and tracking COVID-19 test results. Congratulations to all of these teams on the tools you've developed during this sprint. We're really excited to see the ways these products can serve IVD test users, test producers, and public health agencies. Next, we'll be hearing from a fantastic panel of industry experts who will be sharing their insights on testing and diagnostic data. Let's pass the mic over to them. Thank you to all of those teams. 
After hearing about these exciting new products, I'm pleased to introduce a panel that will help us to think more broadly about the role of industry in GovTech innovation. I'm thrilled to turn it over to Dr. Pooja Jani, medical officer in the FDA's diagnostic data program within the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics. Pooja was also one of our sprint leaders, and she will moderate this panel. Over to you, Pooja. Thanks, Haley, and hi, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome two experts for a reaction discussion, Hong Lu and Walter Sujensky. They'll be joining us to share their thoughts on the broader challenges underlying this work and what's next. So Hung, would you please introduce yourself and share a brief overview of the positions that you hold at UT Southwestern Medical Center, Children's Medical Center, and the College of American Pathologists? Uh, thank you, Pooja. My name is Hung Lu, and I'm Associate Professor of Pathology at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Um, I am also serving in the capacity of Director of Clinical Pathology for Children's Health, a um, pediatric healthcare system in North Texas. I've been uh, an active member of the College of American Pathologists for a number of years now, and I'm currently a member of the uh, Clinical Informatics Committee, and I also serve as the subject matter expert for um, some of the uh, programs that we've been collaborating with the FDA on uh, uh, in the capacity of subject matter expert for uh, laboratory interoperability. Great, thanks, Hong. And Walter, would you please introduce yourself and share a few words about your background in health IT? Sure, thank you. Uh, so I'm Walter Sujanski. I'm the president of a small consulting firm in healthcare informatics called Sujanski & Associates. And uh, we focus on uh, the modeling, sharing and analysis of structured clinical data in uh, in systems like EHRs, uh, disease registries, clinical data warehouses, research databases, uh, and so forth. And uh, we've been doing this for about the past 20 years. Uh, in past lives, I was uh, the director of product development at Hippocrates, um, a, a uh, uh, developer of um, prescribing drug knowledge-based apps, and it's still used today by many clinicians. And uh, I was also the chief technology officer of uh, uh, the California Joint Replacement Registry, uh, which was later folded into the uh, National uh, Joint Replacement Registry. Uh, by way of training, uh, I received my MD and PhD in medical informatics uh, from Stanford Medical School, and I still serve as an adjunct professor there in the Biomedical Informatics uh, Research Center. Uh, like Hung, I'm also a subject matter uh, expert to the FDA, uh, specifically on the SHIELD project, which uh, I think we're going to talk about more uh, in a moment. Great. Thanks so much, Walter. So this question is for both of you. Um, we've heard from great We've heard great presentations from the industry of uh, tech teams who participated in the top sprints this year. From your perspective in the health tech industry, what's the benefit of collaboration between government and industry? And I'll turn it to Hung first. Uh, thank you, Pooja. Um, I think that the benefit, of course, is that I for a very long time now, I think there's been a lag in terms of the technology that's utilized in the healthcare arena as um, compared to uh, the rest of the uh, industries. And I think that this is uh, the example I like to use that is uh, most, uh, I guess, salient to me is the fact that if I go online and I'm reading an article on a website and I happen to see a ad for, let's say, um, restoration hardware, I can click on that ad and I can almost guarantee you that, that by tomorrow I will receive in the mail a hard copy of their catalog. And so you can imagine the amount of integration of data collection and, and a di dissemination that that requires in order to coordinate that kind of uh, activity. And I think that that is um, really absent in uh, the healthcare arena. It's never been easier to move data around, um, but it is uh, exceedingly difficult to do that in the um, healthcare ecosystem because of the fragmentation and, and the technological lag that it's experiencing. So I'm very excited by the for the top sprint because it, it's uh, you know very gratifying to see um, the uh, players coming together and trying to move that forward. And I, but however, I do think that there is definitely a role for government to lead that because obviously um, the risk of uh, someone knowing my um, 
uh, interest in 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 uh, interior design is very low compared to when you're talking about the uh, privacy of uh, patient data. And so I think there's definitely a role for uh, government in terms of establishing the guardrails of where we should move forward uh, in terms of advancing technology, but while also pr uh, protecting and respecting uh, patient data uh, privacies. Thanks, Hung. And how about uh, your thoughts, Walter? Well, uh, I totally agree with with Hung that uh, there's there's a, a great need. There's more data than ever, a more inter, uh, uh, data exchange potentially than ever. Uh, but there's um, still gaps in the useful uh, exchange of data and, and optimal use of uh, all the information that's available. I think industry and and the government. Uh, can collaborate or, or work together uh, with a, a, at least a couple of very specific benefits. One of them is that uh, the, the, the federal government and some state governments, they actually have a lot of resources that are useful and valuable to, to industry participants, to, to, the, to the private sector in terms of data, uh, data that they collect and curate uh, about uh, in the healthcare space, about various trends in public health and in social determinants of health and and other um, data points of of, uh, of uh, public interest that are also can be very useful to uh, private sector participants developing uh, products and services in in the healthcare realm. Uh, they, the federal government also provides actual specific data resources with APIs that can be used uh, to access information, including things like uh, um, vocabulary servers and um, and uh, um, uh, tracking uh, databases and so forth that uh, products can actually directly interface with uh, uh, in, in, in runtime and production use uh, and, and uh, gain benefit from rather than reinventing the wheel, uh, recollecting data, rebuilding uh, and curating uh, databases and knowledge bases, many of those are available already from the government, uh, so there's no need to do that. The, the second way that uh, collaboration, uh, I think, can is very important and can be very helpful to the private sector is that is is in the government's capability to convene stakeholders uh, from various uh, from within an industry, perhaps even competitors within an industry, as well as uh, different stakeholders from uh, different. Uh, uh, sectors of, of the industry who need to work together uh, or, or can benefit from working together uh, to in, in the development and, and deployment of products and services. So, for example, uh, in, in, in our project, which maybe we'll talk about a little later, there are there are stakeholders from uh, um, private sector firms, as well as the government, as well as clinical laboratories, as well as uh, uh, hospitals and outpatient provider organizations and public health agencies and so forth that are all uh, all have requirements as well as uh, uh, ideas and knowledge about their their particular corner of, of the ecosystem uh, that is very valuable to private sector parties that are looking to develop products and services that that meet the needs of that ecosystem. So those are those are two important ways. I think it's. Uh, it's great that there are projects like the TopX and other collaborations uh, between industry and government. Great, and so then building on that, how can industry help to ensure that we're addressing the right problems? And I'll let Walter uh, continue to build on that. Yeah, well, um, that's that's always a challenge. It, you know, uh, usually. Uh, uh, private sector firms they obviously they're they're market focused and their they, they, their 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 profit motive requires that they uh, ultimately meet the needs of some paying customer but but you're right sometimes they're not aware of where, where the most acute needs are and so uh, I think collaborating uh, beyond doing their own market research and market analysis and 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 staying plugged in with trade associations and whatnot uh, being involved in, in government-led initiatives uh, and taking advantage of some of the findings of government data collection and government research also, uh, it can be very useful, very, very helpful in, in understanding uh, where there are unmet market needs. Um, obviously, there's the government itself has certain needs that and, and is a customer, but it, it is also aware of um, needs out in the private sector and, and nonprofit sector uh, and, and, and society at large. 
for uh, for certain healthcare products and services that that the private sector is instrumental uh, and indispensable in in meeting those needs. But as you point out, uh, uh, has it, it's it's not always easy to know exactly what they are and where the 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 product market fit is going to be best in in the healthcare sector. Great. And any further thoughts to add to that, Hung? Um, I think that uh, particularly uh, players in the healthcare industry can c provide input into an insight into the pain points that we are experiencing. Um, obviously, uh, healthcare has changed, and I think that um, it's apparent to everyone that um, patients do not stay with one facility only now, and they are uh, constantly seeking care uh, for their different needs from different organizations. And the uh, need for integrating all that um, information so that we have a complete logical to know history of the patient has been apparent to everyone, but uh, we really haven't been able to solve that in order to uh, increase efficiency, reduce redundancy in terms of uh, re reordering tests that are not needed. So I think that in terms of uh, providing um, the life experience or lived experiences, I think that there's value in, in consulting the, in the industry in terms of what are the uh, pain points we're experiencing. Great, thanks, Song. So you've both been involved in the FDA SHIELD program as industry partners. And for those of you that are new to this program, SHIELD stands for Systemic Harmonization and Interoperability Enhancement for Laboratory Data. Now, Hung, can you please tell us more about this effort and why it's a unique way for industry to collaborate with government? Uh, thank you, Pooja. Yes, uh, SHIELD uh, started as a series of workshops in uh, 2016 that was led by Mike Waters from the FDA when there was the recognition that there was um, a lack of interoperability or there was an it, insufficient uh, laboratory interoperability for the goals of public health and also for uh, regulatory decision making. And so these workshops were held and the consensus was that um, there really needed to be a, a collaborative effort from all the players in the um, uh, uh, healthcare industry in order to move things forward. Um, obviously, every, everybody has been uh, thinking about these issues, but it, it wasn't until SHIELD was established that there was really a uh, aggregation of players from um, all the stakeholder groups. And so there's representation from uh, government agencies, there's representation from uh, large reference laboratories, from um, uh, uh, academic centers from uh, IVD vendors and uh, LIS and EHR vendors, and so and also uh, public private uh, collaborators. And so, it, I think uh, Shield is in a unique uh, place to really claim the title of the voice of laboratory interoperability and to be able to break down the silos that exist and to move everyone forward in uh, one direction to increase uh, interoperability. I think just having all the players at the table and um, and uh, having the transparency and um, the knowledge that we're all trying to uh, push the boat in the same direction has been very helpful. That's great. And so, Walter, can you elaborate on this question by giving giving us an example of the kinds of successes that can emerge from a program like SHIELD? Yeah, sure. So uh, one uh, aspect of SHIELD that I've been working on quite a bit, actually both Hung and I have been working on, is um, the, the uh, uh, specification and development of a particular uh, data repository, of, uh, the purpose of which is to, to uh, help laboratories across the entire country to represent the, the tests that they perform and the results of those tests in a single standardized uniform way so that uh, tests can be aggregated for a variety of purposes and analyzed for a variety of important purposes, both public health as well as patient specific uh, uh, benefits and decision support. Uh, but currently laboratory data uh, uh, reported electronically by one lab versus another lab uh, can be quite differently represented. The exact same test can be quite differently represented. And that's a problem. And uh, and it's been a known problem for a while, but there hasn't been a centralized resource to help resolve it. Uh, the SHIELD project is uh, uh, working to develop something called the Lab Interoperability Data Repository, which which will be a way, will be a shared, a cloud-based uh, public resource uh, in which the, the uniform, correct representation of, of lab tests and lab results 
uh, will be will, will serve as a reference source for that. Uh, and that will be populated by the manufacturers of diagnostic tests. It will be consumed by laboratories uh, who are looking to, to how to represent their tests correctly. It will be consumed by uh, uh, users of EHRs who are looking for what the definitive meaning of laboratory test results that they've received are. It'll be consumed by uh, public health agencies so they can understand when they aggregate data across, across a lot of different uh, uh, geographic locations or, or uh, provider organizations, what, what the meaning of those tests are, the uniform meaning of those tests are. And this, this is an example of, of the uh, of, a, of, a, of a win for uh, collaborations, public-private collaborations, because otherwise, uh, without the government's leadership uh, and, and uh, 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 inception of this type of project, there is not as much of a market impetus by any individual players to develop a resource like this. Yet the, the resource can be extremely valuable for private sector companies and healthcare providers and laboratories and, and the federal government. So its its existence is very important. And, and there's a lot of interest in the, in, in the private sector and participation by the private sector uh, in this initiative. Um, so it's it's been a successful collaboration thus far in conceptualizing and moving towards the, the implementation of something like the, this data repository. It's really helpful information. Thank you, Walter. Um, and so to both of you then, what's next for SHIELD and, and your work? And are there ways that the top community can get involved? Um, and I'll let Walter take this question first. Yeah, so there's there are a lot of things going on. Um, as I mentioned, this this data repository is, is in the in the process of being um, uh, uh, developed. It's 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 being uh, the requirements for it are being specified now and finalized now, and then there'll be implementation and testing phase and so forth. So the private sector, to the degree that 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 uh, there are organizations that uh, can benefit from a resource like this, can, can either contribute data to it or can uh, benefit from the kinds of information about drug, uh, excuse me, lab result uh, uh, representation that will be in it. Um, they can participate in this type of project uh, by helping uh, the, the the community to understand what their requirements are, what their needs are uh, for this type of resource, what particular features they they would want and need it to have, and then to provide feedback as as early uh, uh, versions of it are, are are created, and and to uh, allow um, the developers to fine tune it and to make sure it's going to work for. Uh, all of the stakeholders who are needed uh, to participate for it to work. Again, it's it's something that is not it's that's going to be voluntary, likely uh, at least initially, and so it has to both provide value and be relatively easy to use for those who who whose participation in it is 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 uh, necessary for it to actually exist and be successful. So th again, their feedback is is very important and. Um, you know, if they're not uh, organizations that are not providing feedback, uh, they may find that it's the, the ultimate resource doesn't meet their needs as well as it could have if they had been involved. And any last thoughts to add to that, Hung? Um I think that uh, SHIELD is hoping to uh, provide a series of uh, white papers to kind of uh, uh, lay out the um, uh, thought process for how to represent uh, laboratory data in a consistent manner, no matter where it's uh, um, disseminated throughout the health key ecosystem. So that's useful to everybody uh, downstream, including uh, researchers, um, uh, government agency for regulatory decision making, but also for public health and also for, of course, um, uh, most importantly for patient care. And so I think that um, these um, uh, white paper also represent an opportunity for industry to participate and to make sure that uh, the products that are developed from the SHIELD community uh, meet their needs and answer the questions that they have. Great. So Walter and Hong, thanks so much for this fantastic conversation today. We were so grateful that you were able to join us for this sprint.
Thank you so much, Pooja, and our panelists for all your insights. Before we move on, I'd also like to acknowledge today's keynote speaker, Kristen Honey. We missed the opportunity to introduce her properly, but Dr. Honey is the Chief Data Scientist and the Executive Director of the HHS Innovation X Team for the Office of Science and Medicine in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Her team tackles complex challenges by harnessing the power of open data, open science, open innovation, and public practice private partnerships for health. Previously, Dr. Honey served in the White House advising the U.S. Chief Technology Officer and the Federal Chief Information Officer. Thank you again to Kristen for providing our keynote earlier today. Now we'll move right into our next session featuring more product demos and discussion on government innovation in diagnostic data. If you're just tuning in, we are now moving into the second hour of our Diagnostic Data Solution Showcase. We are about to turn to a second group of technology product demos focused on health data aggregation and social determinants of health. To help us understand the importance of this problem statement, I will now introduce Dr. Hiba Zuia, Epidemiologist for Clinical Evidence Outcomes Research within FDA's Division of Clinical Science and Outreach. Hiba was another one of our sprint leaders from FDA and an expert on these topics. Hiba, over to you. Thank you, Haley. Hello, everyone. I am Hiba Zuiya, and like Sammy, I was one of the FDA sprint leaders for this sprint. As Haley mentioned, I am an epidemiologist in training and a subject matter expert in real-world data, real-world evidence within the Office of Clinical Evidence and Analysis in FDA. My background ranges from research and academia, focusing on maternal and child health-related studies to field epidemiology by joining a COVID-19 response team early in the pandemic. Currently, I'm supporting five COVID-19 projects within the digital diagnostic program, including Top Access Print, with the main focus to ensure the relevance and reliability of the data utilized, which range from testing, clinical, and social determinants of health data, as we will see next. What I found interesting about this print is the uniqueness of each project and how each team approached the problem statement differently for the overall goal of providing evidence-based technologies and innovation for enhancing public health safety and intervention while utilizing open source government data sources. Another challenge that teams approached in this sprint was advancing health data aggregation for improved patient care. In recent years, there has been a massive increase of over-the-counter and point-of-care tests, which are generally conducted outside of physical laboratories and traditional clinical settings. These tests are more disconnected from traditional reporting system. This means that consumers are now more in control of their health data than ever before. However, to inform individual patient care and to ensure an effective public health response, this data needs to be easily captured, transmitted, and analyzed within the right context to ensure the safety of individuals and communities. In this sprint, we encourage teams to use community-level open source data about patients' social determinants of health alongside individual-level data during over-the-counter and point-of-care test use and other medical assessments. This holistic approach can inform more comprehensive care and treatment for individuals as well as a population and community-level interventions. In this sprint, as you will see, teams created tools that help harmonize and aggregate diagnostic data with other information, such as data on chronic disease and social determinants of health, to power analytics for individuals and populations. I'm excited to hear from the teams as they showcase the work they did in the sprint on this critical topic. Thank you, Hiba. Now let's hear from the teams that worked on this problem statement. Six different tech teams tackled this challenge of advancing health data aggregation for improved patient care. We're excited to share the results of this work with you now. Thank you, Haley. Next up, we'll hear from six teams that have developed extremely useful solutions to the important challenge of advancing health data aggregation for improved patient care. Many of them have focused on incorporating data on social determinants of health. First up, we'll hear from GuideHouse, so please take it away, Rod. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rod Fontesilla. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at GuideHouse, 
and we're extremely happy to be able to present to you our solution that is called the a Social Determinant of Health Mapping Service, and MVP. So with that, let's uh, talk a little bit about the solution. Um, our solution brings kind of a combination of AI and data science and data integration. It has four components, kind of an audio to text because we are dealing with telemedicine, uh, entity extraction because out of the text that we grab from the telemedicine session, we're extracting all the medical entities and we're mapping them to the medical dictionaries. And then we do the data integration with all this data that we'll show it to you. And finally, we'll show you a quick demo with the interface that we have provided that is very preliminary, but it shows a little bit kind of the arrow of the possible that we can do with this solution. To start with, I mean, let me walk you through, uh, I mean, the three components. So at the bottom, you see our data storage. I mean, we are creating a data warehouse. It has the patient's database. It has a social determinant of health database as well. On the right-hand side, you have the services that we provide, which is the audio to text, medical entities, the factors, the social determinants of factors, and then some of the predictive factors as we do analytics. And then on the left-hand side, you see the GUI that we're gonna show you as part of the demo that shows the ability to see the, uh, the patients and then drill down into each one of the patients and be able to look at the data. Now, how this is uh, working on the back end, this runs on AWS, it runs on the AWS cloud and it provides uh, essentially um, kind of the ability to ingest all this data we're using uh, the Amazon Health Lake, which is a HEPA compliant uh, data warehouse. And also it brings integrated with it a fire API uh, ability to exchange data with other providers. So what kind of data did we use? We use data from uh, the Chicago Health Atlas. I mean, it's one of the, the best places to work with uh, social determinants of health. You can see here some of the indicators that we have worked with, kind of poverty, behavioral health, violence indicators, and social indicators as well. So there are three pieces of data that we work with. The first one is the patient data. So we use synthetic data, we use Cynthia as a way to generate 50 patients for the pilot. Uh, Cynthia is, some, is a synthetic data generator that was uh, created by MITRE and exclusively dedicated for patient uh, data. The second one is the social determinants of health data. And this, uh, this is where we use the Chicago Health Atlas to bring uh, that data a map to the zip code and to take a look at the difference of social determinants uh, of health indicators vis-a-vis uh, -vis the different zip codes that we have. And you'll see that in the GUI when we present it. And finally, since we were talking about telemedicine, is talking about the kind of the audio. I mean, so we do the telemedicine session, we transfer the audio to text and then from text, we do all the extracting, uh, we extract all the medical conditions and we map it to Medra, to ICD, to Rx norm, depending on the data. So all these data that we aggregate, this is the most important thing is like I mentioned before, we ingested into the AWS Health Lake the Amazon Health Lake is a HEPA compliant a data warehouse, and it comes integrated with a Fire API in a, a, a framework, which allow us then to exchange all this data with um, with any any medical provider, and and that's the beauty about that that we don't only can ingest the data, but we can exchange data in a very secure way with any other medical providers. So with this, I'm going to show you now a little demo of what it is. So our demo will run on our Discover platform. You see the URL at the top. And let me start running the video. As you will see, I mean, you will go to Discover. Discover has many different tiles that we call. And one of those tiles is going to be ours, the uh, Social Determinant of Health Mapping Service. At that point, you get a login and a password. And you log in into it. And you get the list of patients. You start looking at each patient, and remember we have 50 of them that came from the Chicago Atlas, and you can click on each one. And what we're gonna show you is kind of the different uh, pieces of data that we have, kind of medication immunizations, but also the social determinant of health and how do we display that social determinant of health for each one. So as you can see in this particular patient, 
all the patient, I, I mean, all the indicators are red, meaning that this is a patient that needs to be taken care of. And in each one of these social determinants, then you can click on the a hover over the details and it tells you essentially what's going on um, with, the, with that particular uh, piece of data. And so you can start looking at the patient and looking at the, at the code. Then you can go to other patients that perhaps on the opposite side, they look, and when you look at the social determinant of health, they look mostly green, meaning that they're, they're doing pretty well with respect the food stamps and the hardship and the college graduation rate and things like that. And then again, you can hover over the details button and you can see what's going on. And finally, you can go to another patient that will show you that some of these patients not only are on one extreme or the other, but are kind of in between. And, and when these patients are in between, then the color turns to yellow. So we felt that this uh, color coded helps the physicians and helps also the when we start exchanging data with others to take a look at the data and be able to, to see what's going on. So that uh, kind of show you a little bit what the GUI, this is the earliest stages of the GUI. We can call it like an alpha version, but it's available to you on the Discover platform. And finally, uh, what uh, we would like to do is kind of what the next step, uh, some of the next steps that we wanna do is more integration with the EMRs now that we have a fire inter uh, interface and further utilize AWS Health Lake because the Health Lake bring a lot of capabilities and, uh, and then in incorporate all these uh, entities extracted for, uh, uh, from the appointments through an NLP method to also start doing some predictive analytics as well. With that, uh, thank you very much and I really appreciate the opportunity to present to you guys. Thank you, Rod. This is a fantastic and multifaceted solution that holds a lot of potential for healthcare providers and ultimately patients. Um, we're really excited to see where you take it next. Now I'm going to hand it over to Matt and the IBM team. All right. Uh, I'm Matt Dini, and I'm here to talk about the IBM uh, Shape application. So this is an application we developed for the FDA, and uh, we think it has some applications to help collect uh, at-home test data, as well as social determinants of health uh, data that is difficult to collect, and then integrate it into a uh, one place to do analysis and visualization. So uh, next slide. So what we tried to do is we talked to our users, and they came up with three main issues. Uh, that they were facing. Uh, our user groups were state, uh, local, tribal, public health, um, public health analysts or workers. And so the first thing is they were really struggling to collect data on certain populations uh, or certain topics. So at home, over-the-counter test data, uh, definitely one that people aren't reporting. Uh, and then also they had certain populations that were rural or migratory uh, that are not really captured in, um, in census uh, surveys or they're not captured in um, overall health data surveys. So second one is sort of um, opposite of this. The first one, they didn't have enough data, but the second one, they have, they have too much data in other situations where they have data, clinical data, and social determinants of health, um, and data from all of these different sources, but they don't integrate well together, and they're not all in one place. Uh, so you can do analysis and look at correlations. Lastly, they really want to be able to give individuals or providers actionable insights when they needed them. Uh, and so having some sort of application that could push notifications to patients or, or providers when they're at risk or when they need that uh, extra information and resources was really uh, something they were looking for. So uh, next slide. So our shape application uh, helps both uh, public health workers and uh, the users 
by uh, allowing public health workers to set up surveys that they then can um, uh, send out to everyone that has the app uh, to survey one of their um, one of their populations. So we can see our first user is Catherine Whitaker, and she's interested in analysis around at-home COVID test results. Uh, these results are not really reported anywhere, so uh, she also wants to incorporate some SDOH factors into the, her analysis. And our second persona is a user of the Shape app who's going to fill out the surveys. Uh, Mr. Coffey has some social determinants of health conditions. He also has some clinical conditions, and he wants to know if either of these, um, if there are resources to help him with these conditions, or also if there's some interactions between uh, maybe COVID and diabetes that he should know about and, um, and be warned. So our next slide, we'll get into our, uh, an actual demo of the app. So if we start the demo, uh, we can see this is from uh, Mr. Coffey's perspective. He's a lot, uh, he can choose the survey that he's been told to take, and then he, you know, quickly can uh, fill out all these questions. The questions have been developed by our public health worker, and Mr. Coffey can fill them out. So here we can see we're collecting some social determinants of health data. Um, as well as you could also collect uh, you know, any sort of information you want. So this is going to be really helpful for those populations where we don't have any, um, we don't have the social determinants of health information like rural and migratory populations. So the, the second part of it, and if we go to the next slide, is that this also integrates clinical data. Uh, so, after they do the social determinants of health, uh, a screen will pop up, allowing them to search for their health provider. So, we can see here Mr. Coffey is searching for uh, Clark Clinic, and it's going to load that patient data. Um, and what we found, uh, Clark Clinic, and he's going to click on that. Uh, and that's going to take him to a patient portal which allows him to sign in and give his permission uh, to actually use that, um, that data. So if we go to the next slide, so lastly, all of this data then is combined with open public data from the census like uh, or other sources like the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. Uh, and put on one visualization dashboard. So we can see here that some of the um, data for the rural areas are filled in by data collected through the app. Uh, but it also looks at patient data compared to um, maybe so, uh, the homelessness measure from uh, the CDC vulnerability index or um, clinical data like the diabetes rate. Uh, all of this all of this data one in one place for our analysts to do their work. Uh, so that's it for the Shape app. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Matt. This is a very impressive product, and we love how you're integrating SDOH data collection with existing open source data. Great work to the whole IBM team. Next up, we have Oxen. So Greg, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks, everyone. I'm Greg from Oxen AI, and we're here to make versioning your data sets as easy as versioning your code. So who is Oxen for and what is the problem we're solving? We're helping solve the problem number three of advancing health data aggregation for improved patient care. And Oxen is built to enable a collaboration on data between data scientists and engineers and non-technical teams. So what does version control mean and why is it important for data and especially in the health sciences track? To give you a concrete example, I'm sure everybody has seen this where somebody exports a CSV and in order to version it, they put maybe the name and a date. And we actually had this happen 
live in a hackathon where we were collaborating on social determinants of health data for Biosciences LA. And what happened was we had our demo and presentation all working on the data from September 15th. And on the day of the hackathon, they decided to update the data and renamed it 2022-09-16 instead of 09-15. Well, when they did that, they also renamed all of the columns. There were a bunch of new rows. The data set size was completely different. So all of the downstream demos and changes and engineering workflows broke down between those two versions. A better way to do it would have been to put it into a version control system and being able to see these changes as they happen over time and just have one file called rarity.csv instead of just naming it underscore final underscore no for real this time slash 2022. This happens in all sorts of data sets, not just CSVs uh, with the advents of AI uh, from anything from computer vision to natural language processing to large language models, they're all trained on data and this data really evolves over time. So we need to be able to see the changes over time. Software engineers are used to working in Git and GitHub for code. We've built a solution that's similar to that, but for data. We've talked to a bunch of customers and users from health chatbots to the Orlando Magic to this hackathon we talked about before. And what it really is, is a command line tool that mirrors Git that software engineers and data scientists can be really familiar with and work with. And then a web hub that enables anybody else on the team to upload files, collaborate on files and see the changes. So with that being said, I have a quick video demo of the tool in action. We took all of we took a few sample data sets from the challenge and made data repositories for each of them. Here we have the COVID-19 diagnostic laboratory testing data set. If we look at the original source, we can see there's a CSV file here. We can see it was updated at a different date that it was created at. And there were probably a lot of versions in between there that we're not sure what happened to the data. For one, we make it really easy to click into the CSV and see what's going on. And then for two, we have the ability to have different branches, just like you would in code, with different changes to the data. So if you click on the commits over here, you can see a, a nice log of what the engineers and data scientists and data team was doing to the data over time. Here we click into a change that said we filtered down new results reported to everything greater than zero, which might be a red flag that you might want the engineering team to look at. We click into these changes, we can see the CSV beforehand, we can see the CSV after, and we can see all of the removed rows from that data set. So you can see everything in the new results reported was filtered to things that were greater than zero, uh, which would probably be a problem for downstream applications. Here's another example of just adding uh, 3,100 new rows. You can click into the data frame and already we see some problems with this data. It has multiple headers that it shouldn't have, but we can quickly dive into the, the rows that were added and debug further. Okay, why are there too many headers in this data? The last commit fixes those changes. Dive in again. This is the current version. This is the old version. And you can even see on the left-hand side the actual schema of the data has changed because it detected these columns as strings instead of integers because of the rare changes. Finally, once you go into a version of the data, we made it really easy for anybody to query this data. You don't have to be a data scientist. You don't have to know SQL. You can just type in natural language, aggregate up the state name field by count. And it took and wrote the SQL query for you. Uh, even though we just wrote the query in natural language. I said, sort it ascend or sort it descending, and it sorts all of the columns. As a data scientist, you can dive in and see what the actual SQL was that generated that. And it just makes it really easy for anybody on the team 
to come in and kind of do exploration on the data without being an engineer or a data scientist. So here we're doing what is the average new results reported for Alabama? And it aggregated up that field, calculated the average, and gave us a SQL query for it. So we have all of these data sets live on oxen.ai slash FBA. If anybody wants to download them, play with them, see how they changed over time. If you want to put your own data into Oxen, we're live and you can download the tooling to do that. If you want to learn more, email us at hello at oxen.ai. And also star our GitHub repository. We like to say for every GitHub star, an Ox gets its pair of wings. Thanks so much, Greg. I That was great. And I know that some of the other teams in the sprint have already benefited from this indexing that you've done, and I'm sure others will as well. This is a really, ex, you know, very useful tool. Um, so thank you so much for that. Now we'll hear from Social Determinants Indexing and Cloud Leap Technologies, um, which are two teams that connected over the course of the sprint. Brian and Prashant, I'll hand it over to you. Well, hello. I am Brian Donahue, the president of the Social Determinants Indexing Incorporated. We know that our country spends an ever-increasing percentage of our gross national product on healthcare. Yet, our results in terms of longevity and life expectancy, as compared to the other countries of the world, is mediocre. We have to do better. What are we not seeing? So on January 7th, the AMA and the U.S. Center for Medicaid and Medicare announced a new compensation rate for healthcare professionals. Compensation is at a higher rate when addressing and dealing with the social determinants of health. Basically, financially incentivizing the provider to address the source of the problem. The artwork, dealing with the source of the problem upstream not just the symptoms that present themselves downstream. So how can we achieve this result and not take up the limited time of the provider? This next slide shows the social determinants being displayed on a map next to the electronic health record. The determinants are an equal partner in the diagnosis and treatment plan. The next slide, shows that with one click, the provider can drill down to the next level of detail on the social determinants on the right. There are colored alarm lights to alert the provider to the outliers, or simply toggle over to the next level of detail on the left in the electronic health record. The next slide also shows with one click, the provider can drill down to the actual inventory of the data sets. And this, these data sets vastly expand the government set of data which is available. We categorize the data in what we call the five pillars of health, which is a new way we categorize the social determinants. One more click down, the provider can get to the raw data, and in some cases, that's what's needed. The next slide demonstrates that this model of ours can be easily moved into a non-medical mobile app, but to be aware, we are not an artificial intelligence or machine le learning. The provider remains responsible for the system and the for the patient, of course. Our system is like a, a tool in a toolkit. Last slide, our outcome is diagnosis and treatment of the whole patient, better healthcare decisions, improved compensation for the provider, and reduction of the overall cost. Krishant will now explain the engineering side. Thank you, Krishant. Thank you, Brian. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Prashant um, with Cloud Leap Technologies. Uh, what you see here is like the actual uh, EHR screen from Kaiser Permanente. Uh, it's actual patient data. Uh, and what we are proposing is in addition to the uh, blocks that you see for the different health conditions, that we would also present the SDOH and the SDO SD index data, which are based on the patient zip code uh, and displayed right alongside the other health data. And what we propose and how do we plan to do this? Uh, we have built an API that can be consumed universally by any EHR software. It's EHR agnostic. And the data is delivered using the FHIR standards. Uh, and that way it's compatible with uh, any EHR software. There's a separate API for each characteristic. Uh, the medical provider essentially enters the zip code for the patient where they, are, where they live and the zip code gets converted to a Zikta uh, because we're using census data. And that's what the census data is classified using. Um, and basically we use the API to retrieve the data and display alongside the other EHR data. The federal open data that we used was the Census Bureau survey data. The ACS data, which you see here uh, are the four characteristics that we used uh, uh, specifically for the California uh, data set that was part of the Census Bureau. And again, this is a zip code to Zikta conversion uh, so that we can pull this data. And I'm gonna now do a short demo uh, of the system. So what you see here is uh, a patient EHR data. On the left side, you see the other medical information for the patient. And right alongside that data, you see the SDOH data. So the doctor comes in and clicks on the SDOH uh, menu item, and they get presented with uh, the zip code where they enter the patient's zip code. Uh, we plug in one of the zip codes in California and hit go. Uh, and the system essentially uses the API, reaches out to the back end of the database and pulls the information. We also display a little map uh, that kind of shows you uh, at the location where the zip code is in California, uh, so that uh, the doctor gets an idea of where exactly the patient is living. And then you also see the different characteristics uh, for the SDOH data, which are color coded. There's also a score uh, and it kind of gives them a quick visual of uh, you know, what that uh, characteristics are. On the right side, you see the influencing factors, which kind of tells you what that data is made up of. Now we'll go and enter a second zip code. Uh, this one happens to be for the Los Angeles area. Uh, again, it goes back and pulls the information from the database. We display a little map that shows you uh, where that person is living. Um, and at the bottom, you see the different characteristics. Again, it's color coded. In this case, there's a lot of red uh, that kind of gives the doctor a visual of where this patient lives. And, and then uh, they can use this information along with the other medical information to make an accurate diagnosis for the patient. So this concludes our demonstration. Thank you very much. Amazing work. We're so happy to see the outcome of your collaboration and really appreciate the passion for this topic that you've brought to the sprint. We're really excited to see where you both take this work next. All right, so now we will hear from the Aerospike and Morphworks team. So I will now hand it over to Chris. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. I'm, uh, I'm Chris Oglesby with Morphworks. Uh, briefly, Aerospike is a data platform that allows for access across data resources, providing access real-time, granular, and error accurate. Uh, Morphworks is a consulting firm that helps organizations evolve while making change desirable. Our focus on this sprint, simply aggregation. Our goal, giving a single location to create real-time health decisioning. We created a feature store to help data professionals that deal with large volumes of data better support the health user community through real-time health decisioning. For most analysts, they deal across environments to support their missions. Our goal was to present an integrated environment and provide single access. We have proven this for many customers. One in ingested and aggregated 
over 50,000 data sources for real-time trend analysis. This can be viewed in a holistic health 360 view that gives a patient uh, perspective overall. From a data valuation standpoint, what we really looked at were the four data sources. Two were real-time, two were historic, with over 100 million line items and growing. We focused on a unique topic for this sprint around hospital bed availability. We could do that because of an integrated view of the data. We were able to aggregate the data, have an understanding of the health hospital environment, and be able to deliver that in a BI tool. As we integrated this into the BI tool, we created a specific national footprint. From the data, we then were able to drill down into a, uh, from a national level into a local level, uh, in, or into a state level and into a local level, giving healthcare providers, emergency professionals, a better understanding of the hospital availability, beds, and other information that was provided in the data sets. What this allows is you to drill down, get a better understanding from a local perspective on what you can see in a hospital from this data. For the real-time access, it provides what's going on from a, a bed availability in each of the hospitals. From a historic standpoint, it allows for hospitals and uh, practitioners to view trend analysis and ultimately drive towards a better understanding for emergency response, healthcare professionals being able to uh, direct uh, patients to a hospital that they could get into quicker because of an understanding of the, the information that we're able to provide. One of the key unique features is with the uh, Aerospike data platform, we aren't worried with historic, to da historic data, which allows uh, uh, storage, which allows us to be able to present trend analysis and understanding of what's going on and what has happened in an environment. So a specific hospital, a specific region at the state level, at a national level, you have a much better understanding of how the environment is working for the hospital system. This has all been done because of our single integration platform on the Aerospike uh, data platform. From the standpoint of the Sprint collaboration, this work was made possible by engaging with a number of SMEs to understand how the data was used and picking out data sets that could help an overall health community. Our goal was really to create a platform, again, that was singular in focus, but had the ability of diverse mission pulls. So by having multiple data sources in one environment gave you the ability to think of the art of the possible for what you could do in the health community. So for our next steps, with approval, we enhance the true mission of this for the stakeholders and synthesize the data sets, expanding where needed, adding real-time data for emergency, weather, IoT devices, launch and understand uh, the use and impact in the health community, and evolve and serve the overall mission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris Kung and the rest of the, the Aerospike and MorphWorks team. Um, this is a really impressive data aggregation platform, and we're really very grateful that you were able to deploy it for this challenge. Last but not least for this segment, we'll hear from Rachel, who's sharing the fantastic work that the DataKind team conducted during the sprint. Rachel, please go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Wells and I'll be sharing about Datakind's contributions to the top FDA sprint this summer. 
So before we get started, Datakind is a global nonprofit that has spent over the last 10 years working with expert data science volunteers and social impact organization partners with the mission of harnessing the power of data science in the service of humanity. And for this sprint, we brought together a diverse group of volunteers to explore the data and just ideate on possible solutions with social actors and with subject matter experts in order to really focus on the thoughtful design to support safe engagement with public and private data for folks experiencing social determinants of health instead of uh, rushing to build a product. So unlike all the amazing products you just saw, I won't be presenting a product demo today. Instead, we'll just be sharing some insights that might inform future work. Our first question was if it might work to develop language models that take privacy terms full of legalese and long documents that are difficult for consumers to understand as an input and convert them into clear summaries for consumers. Uh, folks we're thinking about as end users include someone seeking care in the United States who doesn't speak English fluently or elderly patients who have a lot of difficult interactions with healthcare systems alongside difficulty with technology or reading fine print or um, even seeing just small uh, characters on the screen. And what we discovered is that OpenAI's chat GPT already summarizes questions around common privacy terms pretty well, but ensuring accuracy is a real blocker to use of large language models right now for this type of use case. And so we've developed a concept note from the AI side, but would want to work with privacy term experts and see this technology develop um, to move this solution forward. If you want to discuss something like this for a long-term collaboration, uh, Datakind would be open to it, but we're not going to pursue it in the short term, which brought us to our second idea. We explored existing data sets to identify data that might be useful for comparative analysis when combined with users securely sharing their data in order to get real-time feedback on action words that they can use with a doctor to get treatment for their areas of greatest risk. So an example of what this might look like, someone could report certain symptoms into an app for an end user of a pregnant woman in a rural setting They might enter their data um, in a maternal health app about their uh, test results or their weight or different uh, symptoms they're experiencing in their pregnancy. Or a diabetes patient um, in a rural setting as well might be interacting with a virtual healthcare provider due to their remote location and uh, don't, not having access to different healthcare. So they might be um, reporting on their symptoms and updating of their condition. And so the model would tell them how rare or common the symptoms are for similar people and what they might want to talk to their doctor about based on their context and their individual health situation. It might ask if there's a helpline or whether the pregnant person should be calling a nurse or just waiting until their next appointment. It might um, suggest for the diabetes patient a telemedicine specialty consultation. Sometimes folks in rural settings could be hesitant to look for specializations because they don't see it, it as an option locally. So the intention here is to help people feel confident in describing their symptoms and speaking the language. We also looked into the feasibility of integrating social services data to ultimately integrate services for simpler learning curves. Uh, Datakind's been doing a lot of work recently with benefits access, and we see a touch point there as well. So one example of this could be telling the pregnant person about how prenatal vitamins or some foods with certain important nutrients for their situation actually qualify for SNAP benefits that they um, already participate in. And we learned through this sprint that this system cohesion would go a long way in patient trust and confidence. That said, just as with the previous concept, we'll only move this modeling work forward in partnership with social actors closely integrated with communities impacted. And so if integrating this type of AI sounds useful to your work, please reach out to us at Datakind and we'd love to discuss partnering. So we came to these ideas through analysis of correlations between social determinants of health and health variables using many federal open data sets across a variety of areas, including education, income, and food security and obesity. And in our analysis, it brought us to identify a third solution idea. Uh, we spent a lot of time exploring data and reading social determinant of health data set documentation that was over 400 pages 
long. And we realized there's a huge need for reliable, easy to use, single source of social determinant of health metadata so that people can make decisions based on this information. So using data kind or um, Google's data cards as inspiration, we mocked up a dashboard that captures the most important elements of each data set for accountability and proper use. So this includes source of the data, original purpose, how it was collected, how it was adjusted, if it's updated, what it can be used for, regions or con county level information uh, to support harmonization, different things like that. So shown here, for example, a user looks at neighborhood atlas area deprivation index scores and can learn about the creation of the data set, who produced it, what it indicates. For example, if a user highlights the state of Arkansas and it indicates interest in a health concern, the number of people with obesity would light up. So to minimize potential harm and maximize accurate utility of these existing open data sets, DataKind could build out this dashboard consisting of data cards and maps. And the creation of standardized data cards specifically designed for open data sets could help ensure transparency and context are included in all efforts to use this government data. So what does this look like for DataKind in terms of next steps? We develop data science and AI solutions in close partnerships with social impact organization partners. So our next step would be to identify community-based organizations already working in the digital healthcare industry that would want to partner with us in developing these solutions to fit their specific use cases. So this could be a health platform developers or healthcare providers, public interest groups, or just you and any other sprint participants. <laughs> So with that, please feel free to reach out to us if you're interested in learning more or discussing any of these concepts. And thanks so much. I'll be eager to take any questions and feedback in the chat. Thanks so much, Rachel. This is great research and de design work, and we're excited to see you take this project forward. Fantastic work again to all of the teams that focus on this problem statement. Your deployment of community-level open source data about social determinants of health holds great potential for enhancing community-level interventions and informing comprehensive care for individuals. Next, we'll hear from some about some innovative work being done within government that's focused on capturing and ingesting data from IVDs. Back to you, Haley. Thank you to all of the teams who presented. Now we're excited to turn to a panel that will explore how government is innovating approaches to ingesting data from IVDs. To moderate this panel, please welcome back Sammy Begg, digital health subject matter expert at the FDA's Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality, and one of the FDA Sprint leaders. Over to you, Sammy. Thank you, Haley, and um, I'm excited to uh, welcome our panelists. But before I do that, I do want to give out a quick uh, shout out to all the teams um, who have done an amazing job uh, so far presenting their products and all the demos. It's exciting to see where uh, this eight eight month journey has led us to, and exciting uh, to hear about your product for the rest of the teams. Uh, also, a big thank you to Thera, who's working uh, in the background and has worked throughout the duration of the sprint, coordinating all the presentations and everything that you see today. Uh, so today uh, on this panel with me are um, uh, Andrew Weitz from the National Institute of Health and Max Kramer from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, as we start, Andrew, uh, I'd love for you to give a, a brief uh, background and uh, your experience at uh, NIH. Sure, thanks, Amy, and uh, thanks for having me today. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a program director at the NIH, and maybe I'll just talk briefly about what the NIH is in case people aren't familiar. Um, it is, we are the largest funder of biomedical research in the world, so we have a annual budget of about $50 billion. Uh, most of that goes towards funding biomedical research in the U.S. Uh, with the overall goal of improving uh, health and health outcomes. And um, there's a bunch of different institutes at the NIH. I'm at an institute called the NIBIB, uh, where our focus is on the uh, two Bs, bioimaging and bioengineering. So a lot of the work that we do and that we fund is focused on uh, healthcare technology development. Um, I'm also here representing a program called RADx, uh, that which stands for Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. And this was a program uh, that received a, a large amount of funding from Congress uh, throughout the pandemic on the order of a billion and a half dollars with the overall goal of speeding the development and validation and commercialization of um, 
mostly point of care uh, tests and home based tests. Uh, and a lot of the work that we did early on and that we're still doing is uh, for COVID testing, but we've more recently begun branching out into other types of tests. Uh, and within the Radix program, I serve as the digital health lead and my, my work really focuses kind of on the ones and zeros of testing. So how do we capture data from home tests? How do we get those data to public health agencies um, in a standardized way such that they can be used for public health surveillance? And how can we combine home testing uh, with other types of technologies like telehealth. Uh, back to you, Sammy. Great. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for that great uh, background and information about, you know, how important the work that you guys do has been, uh, you know, to uh, COVID and beyond. Um, with that, I'd like, uh, Max, uh, for you to introduce yourself and talk about your work uh, on the CDC uh, report stream. Thanks, Sammy. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Max Kramer. I'm with NAVA, a public benefit corporation working to make government services more simple, effective, and accessible to all. And I currently serve as product management lead for CDC's ReportStream platform. ReportStream was created uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic to help get public uh, health departments at the state, local, tribal, and territorial levels close to real-time data on COVID-19 testing in their jurisdictions. The team did this by making it super easy for labs and data intermediaries to integrate with ReportStream and send us test results in whatever format was best for them. Then we did the work of delivering those test results to the correct jurisdiction in the format they preferred. By meeting all of our partners where they are, ReportStream facilitated reporting of 40 million test results in the past two years, equating to 190 years of manual reporting time saved. Uh, today, we continue to route COVID-19 testing data from labs to public health departments nationwide. We are also expanding our offerings to include other conditions and other use cases. Great. Uh, thanks, Max, and thanks for that uh, quick overview. I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, and before we get into the weeds, I think, um, you, you know, uh, you heard from all these great group of tech teams, and I do want to thank you both for, uh, you know, laying the groundwork by your presentations that you did early on. I think that was a great uh, way for the teams to understand what the government is doing and what can what tools are available. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the diagnostic, you know, data space and, you know, what you, you know, learned from some of the teams uh, based on what work they are doing and also the roles NIH and CDC has uh, in this uh, space uh, working with industry and creating some of the unique, um, you know, opportunities to collaborate to, um, you know, address the needs of the public. And maybe I'll start with you, Andrew. Uh, sure. So I think you just touched on one, uh, which is that we, uh, federal government, NIH, CDC, FDA, often serve as coordinators of this type of work, uh, bringing multiple teams together to achieve common goals. Uh, we also serve as funders uh, in that space, data providers. A lot of these teams used open uh, federal data sets. Um, but I think maybe a kind of more interesting answer uh, is also on the policy side. Um, so I noted that several of the projects and presentations that we heard earlier leveraged FHIR uh, for healthcare information exchange. Uh, and FHIR really has become the de facto standard for how we exchange health IT information. Uh, and I'm not sure how many people know this, but a large part of that reason is because of policies set by the federal government. So, for example, the 21st Century Cures Act uh, mandated the use of a standard uh, for health IT information exchange. And then the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, later went on to establish what's called a final rule, or effectively a policy that said, let's make that standard FHIR. And because of that, now pretty much everybody uh, now uses FHIR for health IT information exchange. Um, so again, I think I, my answers would really be on the kind of coordination side, the funding side, the policy making side. Um, that's the type of roles I see us play. Great. Uh, thank you for that. And Max, uh, your thoughts on this? Sure. Um, to build on what Andrew said about uh, government's role as a coordinator, so I think government has a great opportunity to provide public utilities in the health and data, health data and reporting space. Um, as Andrew said, for many of the projects we just heard about, this took the form of 
publicly available data sets that the teams were able to build and innovate on. And for me, it's, it's just always really inspiring to see uh, the output of sprints like these where industry and government work together, knowing that some of the solutions will scale to have major impact in our communities. Um, Report stream itself serves as a coordinator. So we're, we are a public health, public utility that helps foster collaboration between the public and private in that we offer a pretty unique value prop proposition for private labs and providers, helping them to meet their reporting requirements at no cost to them. And on the other end of the data flow, um, ensuring that public health agencies have timely, high quality data from industry. Okay, great. Um, so on to the next question, you know, many of our teams and the FDA sprint itself focused on increasing the data we have from at-home tests. Uh, what have you found to be most challenging about encouraging patients to report their results from self-tests? And, you know, how has the home test to treat program sought to address these challenges? And I know, Andrew, uh, you worked on, you know, some of these things. So could you tell us, uh, you know, give us a little bit um, based on your, you know, great experience, especially during COVID-19 and beyond? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I actually want to uh, call out and give a shout out to one of the presentations I saw earlier, which uh, included a survey of, I think it was around 200 people about uh, why they didn't report their home COVID test results. Uh, and I was um, I pleased to see that the reasons that were reported there were, were some of the same reasons that I've observed uh, over the past couple of years, more so anecdotally. Um, and I think the two primary ones are that uh, people don't know how to report home COVID test results, uh, and people don't know that it's important to report uh, home, their home COVID test results, and especially negative test results. Um, and it's there's not really a, a you know simple easy way to educate the public on this. So what we've tried uh, to do is to make it uh, very simple for people who test at home to be able to report. Uh, one of the ways that we've done this is to set up a website called makemytestcount.org, uh, which you can go to and spend about 30 seconds uh, inputting the result of any home COVID test you've taken. Uh, you can remain anonymous when you do that. If, you, if you're concerned about privacy, that was also called out in the survey uh, that that team presented earlier, uh, that privacy is important. Um, and, uh, and then off it'll go. That test result will get reported to the appropriate public health agencies. Um, but we're still dealing with the challenge of not many people knowing that this site exists. We have a very limited marketing budget. Um, and so we're always thinking about how can we grow awareness of the site and how can we incentivize people to report their home COVID test results. And this goes back to what you just mentioned about a program called Home Test to Treat. Um, and so through this program, we're enabling people who test positive for COVID at home and report that positive test result to get free and immediate uh, connection to care uh, utilizing telehealth. Um, and then they get evaluated for treatment, uh, in this case for COVID-19, and they, they can have those treatments shipped right to them overnight or pick them up at a local pharmacy. And we're doing this right now for COVID, but you can imagine, and, and it's in our not too distant future to be able to do this for other uh, diseases that will be testable at home like influenza. Great, thanks, Andrew. I think, you know, it's very important for us to understand how um, essential it is for these test results to reach, you know, uh, the right, um, you know, stakeholders, whether it's the public health department uh, locally or the federal, uh, you know, uh, HHS, because a lot of the public health decisions are made based on this. So the importance of these you know, negative tests and tests done at home are very important, uh, you know, to, to, to be reported are very important. In fact, I actually just came across something uh, earlier this week that now in the future, we might be able to print a test at home through 3D printers. I don't know if our audience is, uh, has uh, you know read the story or any of you have read it, but uh, it's very interesting where we're going. And that makes the work that you guys are doing you know very, very important because uh, now we have another set of data that might not reach uh, the decision makers. So could you, uh, you know, in reference to that, you know, tell us a little bit more about the Radex Mars and you know what that entails and how it can help uh, in this uh, sort of uh, situation that we find ourselves in with data exchange and and everything else related to it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Radix Mars is a program that we established uh, effectively to tackle uh, the challenges that you just spoke of is, and the, address the importance of 
capturing diagnostic data that's collected in a home setting. Um, and that became really important uh, during the pandemic when there was this major shift of testing out of the laboratory, out of doctor's offices, into the home. And all of a sudden, we were dealing with um, lack of insight into the amount of COVID cases throughout the country. Uh, and so we established this uh, RADx Mars program. In this case, uh, Mars stands for Mobile at Home Reporting Through Standards um, to really uh, promote uh, home-based uh, test data capture in a standardized manner using some health IT standards like FHIR, like HL7v2. So this program established standards uh, for home diagnostic data. And then we worked with uh, the report streams, uh, to, uh, worked with the home test manufacturers to really get adoption of those types of standards, as well as makemytestcount.org. Um, such and, and what this enables um, us to do is to get effectively higher quality data that's more interoperable in our downstream public health systems. Because if everybody's using the same standard to represent a test result that's collected at home, regardless of who submits that test result or what type of technology it's captured from, it all winds up in the same place and it all looks the same. Um, and this is really going to become even more important as we have additional types of tests beyond COVID tests uh, that are available in the home setting. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, Max, over to you. So how does Report Stream, um, you know, work and how is it evolving? And what is your team expanding beyond COVID-19 um, to other health conditions? Totally. So we are in the process of growing beyond our original goals of facilitating COVID test reporting. Um, to do that, we're working to support other conditions for electronic lab reporting and also expanding to other use cases. So on the ELR front, we're working with different labs and public health agencies to prove out routing first for other respiratory diseases like influenza and RSV. And in the next, in the coming months, uh, we'll be expanding to STIs and other reportable conditions. Um, we are already live for influenza and RSV with one state public health agency and have more partners and conditions coming along soon. Um, beyond ELR, we're also working to support the full life cycle of a diagnostics data journey um, by adding functionality for test orders in addition to test results. So we're in the process of rolling this out now with a few pilot partners and hope to make it available uh, more broadly in 24. Um, last but not least, to do all of this, we've built a future-proof data pipeline on top of the FHIR standard as well as a format conversion engine that can translate HL7 to FHIR or vice versa. Uh, we're also working to support another key user need, which is CSV to FHIR conversion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, meeting our partners where they are is part of the report stream ethos, um, allowing our partners to send or receive in whatever format works best for them is really key to our work. Good. And, and Max, how can you know people follow the work of Report Stream? Sure. So I think the, the best place to learn about Report Stream is our website, reportstream.cdc.gov. If you visit the developers tab there, you'll find links to our code base in GitHub as well as our release notes page. And if you're a healthcare organization or public health agency interested in working with us, uh, take a look at the Getting Started tab for a more in-depth introduction. Great, thank you. And, um, and I mean, to both of you and Andrew, you can you can start, you know, what's next for these programs and what are you excited about in this work moving forward and what do you see um, on the horizon? Yeah, I think uh, one area is something that uh, Max just spoke about and that is uh, other types of tests. So COVID was a really great first step, but um, we're about to see a, a ton of different other types of tests enter the home setting. Uh, hopefully starting with flu this respiratory season, our RSV also Max mentioned, STI testing, uh, just really a wealth of other uh, diseases and conditions that people used to have to travel to a lab for and wait for the result. Uh, we'll be able to test for uh, and get a result you know, within 20 minutes at home. And it's important as this shift continues to happen that we continue to be able to capture those data in standardized ways so that we can get them reported to public health. 
Um, and then I, I'd say the other uh, for me on the horizon, uh, and this is in the, a little bit more distant future, but something we're very interested in is now having really solved the kind of technological challenge of how do we get data from a home test to a public health agency? Um, wouldn't it be great if we could also get those data, same data to people's healthcare providers so that they could get connected to care? And it's a much more challenging problem. Uh, there's, you know, we've got 50 states uh, that have public health systems. We have many, many more than 50 doctor's offices around the country. Um, and it's a very fragmented uh, kind of health IT infrastructure. Um, but it could do a lot of good for people if they were able to get a test result through a click of a button into to their EHR, to their primary care doc, um, so that they could get the care that they need. Great. And Max, uh, just you know, some brief comments to, uh, on that topic. Sure. So yeah, as I as I said before, ReportStream is really excited to expand our offering to other conditions, to other use cases. Um, at at its core, ReportStream is meant to be a flexible platform that meets users where they are. And our goal is really to put better, faster data in the hands of our partners um, with the goal of reducing disparities in public health services. And we are really excited to keep working on that. Great. Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I hope uh, all of you found um, you know, their comments and their analysis and his history uh, helpful uh, and also both have had some great experience during COVID-19, which we are now translating to go beyond, um, you know, um, COVID, uh, as they as they mentioned. Uh, with that, uh, we'll have a time for probably a one or two minute break, and I'll hand it over to Haley uh, to um, to tell you more about the, what's coming up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, Max. Thank you so much to Sammy and our panelists. We are grateful to have your perspective and thank you for being a part of the top community. Next, we will take a very short break and then continue with the final set of product demos. So please feel free to grab a, a drink of water, a drink of coffee, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, we are now moving into the final segment of our Diagnostic Data Solution Showcase. Over the past two hours, we've heard technology demos from nine teams focused on capturing data from at anywhere tests and aggregating data to improve patient care. Now we'll turn to our last group of product demos, followed by one of the top community's most valued discussions, reactions from the user advocates who helped to advise the teams and their reflections on what's next. The final problem statement 
for this sprint focused on enabling at-home testing with telehealth platforms. The use of telehealth has expanded dramatically during the recent pandemic as providers and patients needed to safely deliver and access healthcare services from remote settings. Telehealth is now being adopted as an essential part of standard healthcare. To help us understand why this problem statement was so important to tackle, I'd like to now hand it over to Pooja Jani, who moderated a panel earlier today. She is another one of the FDA sprint leaders who generously contributed her time to ensure this sprint was a success. Pooja, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Pooja Jani, and I'm a preventive medicine and public health physician and a medical officer at FDA. I'm especially excited about introducing this telehealth problem statement today because during my residency training, I had the opportunity to lead a research team in building out a statewide teleretinal screening network as a collaboration between the UNC ophthalmology department and five primary care clinics across North Carolina. The purpose of this program was to improve diabetic retinopathy evaluation by bringing point of care digital retinal imaging to the primary care office so that we could increase access to high quality subspecialty eye care for diabetic patients living in rural and underserved parts of the state. At the time I was doing this work, telehealth was still a nascent healthcare delivery method, but the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated its use and there's been a real boom in the use of telehealth over the past few years. I find this continued evolution and uptake of telehealth really exciting for the future of medicine and public health, and it's one of the reasons I was drawn to working on the TopX Sprint. So telehealth holds a number of potential benefits for patients that have not yet been fully realized. For example, it can potentially be integrated into a wider range of care, including over-the-counter and point-of-care testing. Telehealth services may also help encourage patients to share relevant, de-identified data for public health decision-making, which would help to protect the health and safety of their communities. With this problem statement, we challenge teams to use federal open data to create new tools and enhance existing platforms and technologies that integrate telemedicine with diagnostic testing and other forms of healthcare. We hope that the tools you're about to see will ultimately help to foster stronger doctor-patient relationships while centering education, knowledge sharing, and trust. Now let's hear from the teams that worked on this problem statement. It's now time to kick off our final round of lightning talks from the teams that focus on leveraging telehealth and digital health platforms to improve care for patients and consumers. We're going to start this segment with a presentation from Organizational Performance System. So Jim and Tom, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our presentation. I'm Jim Hill, CEO of Organizational Performance Systems. Ops is a cloud application company focused on organizational and community betterment. I'm joined today by Tom Moore, our VP of Engineering. Tom can't talk. He has non-COVID flu-like symptoms, but he wanted to be here. So beyond being the brains behind the application you'll see today, he's going to be our official navigator. You can see our motives for this project here, which align to the objectives laid out by Census and FDA. Our focus has been on improving self-help diagnosis and healthcare matchmaking with a particular focus on helping those in need. It dovetails with a similar project that we did, also initiated via a census sprint about three years ago. You can see what we're aiming for here. This is also a good time to say thank you to our user advocates. All right, so our approach provides many advantages. It supports many common health issues and any new issue is easy to add. It also provides a two-way matchmaker, but the truly unique feature of what we're doing is a rewards-based model that incentivizes people to take better care of themselves and their families. While our main focus is patients, our goal is to tie the whole community together. And so that includes patients, that includes healthcare providers and leaders. All right, to start, uh, I wanna do a little demo here. Um, this application works on a computer, a tablet, or a phone. 
There's nothing to download and nothing to install. Once a participant logs in for the first time each day, they're going to get one simple question, which is, how do you feel? The information, this information anyway, can be aggregated for the whole community or for neighborhoods just to get a general sense of how people are feeling. Uh, this has a lot of uses related to attitudes as well as general health. Now, when we get to the home screen, let's just talk about it for a minute. The page is automatically resized on this application to fit whatever device is being used. We're going to flip between screen sizes today for the purpose of this conversation. On the dashboard, you'll see that users can do a lot of things. Uh, and each one of the things that they intend to do is going to be related to their specific needs. But we're going to stay focused on healthcare today. So the first thing the system wants to know is when the symptoms first started and what issue the user is experiencing. That leads to a set of symptoms for that particular issue. For example, for a wound that won't heal, these symptoms are displayed. Here's another example for UTI. I want you to note that everything is written in plain language because we're focused on end users, not healthcare providers. Users, again, they select the symptoms they're experiencing, and once the minimum criteria for an infection are met, the box at the bottom of the screen turns green and users receive feedback or recommendations for subsequent action. That leads to the next screen where users can see providers near their place of residence. That's the blue pin. Let that come up here. The circle that you see, that red circle, is a five-mile radius. They can click on any provider for more information, or they can select a provider and start an electronic conversation. What I'm not showing here today is what we call a community bulletin board. Um, that's a place where that lists participants' needs without exposing their PII. And uh, providers can actually go in, browse that list of patients, see who they might be able to help, and initiate contact from their end. Okay, so to be clear about something, a name-to-name -name contact is not made unless a participant opts in. All right, now let's switch over to decision makers for a minute. We've added a lot of open data that we can overlay with local information from our system. For example, this screen is showing a number of bubbles that identify areas of poverty by density. So red is high, orange is moderate level of poverty, and blue is low. We can combine our data showing participating healthcare providers. That's the pins. Uh, so what you see here this is pretty interesting, actually, is there appears to be fewer providers in areas of high poverty density. Again, the red circles. Uh, this is something a community or community leaders might want to take a look at. So that's the system in a nutshell. To wrap up, we're looking forward to expanding access to this tool beyond our current work in Charleston. And so any community that's interested or willing to participate, we want to hear from. Just use our contact info to get things started. I really thank you for being here today. This has been a fun, rewarding, and worthwhile project. And we really appreciate your interest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim and Tom. This is a really useful tool, and we love your emphasis on collaborating with community partners at the local level. Also, we're grateful to have you both back as returning top participants. Next, we will hear from Rikiro. So take it away, Daniel. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Wang. I'm the Vice President of Payer Strategy here at Rikiro Health, where we provide a digital care delivery mechanism and software system for uh, health plans, employers, providers, and uh, everyone within the healthcare ecosystem. Um, as part of the sprint, we're we're challenged with a variety of different issues being in the telemedicine space and digital health space, uh, but where we've been primarily focusing these efforts um, as part of this sprint is really heavily on member engagement, where we look to um, leverage a variety of different data sources, both from our 
uh, clients, as well as public data sources, as we'll kind of notice um, on the next slide. But um, as we get into the engagement model, right, the uh, the inevitable kind of choices that we have or that the patients have in uh, offering and, and having um, healthcare services available to them are, are truly exactly what we're trying to aim for and in solving the issues around, uh, especially in the technology space. And so by engaging members directly, uh, they'll have better access to care, they'll have access to testing and diagnostics, as well as for the health plans, they'll have support in um, clinical care and gap compliance. Uh, during the sprint, we leveraged a variety of data sources to improve some of the engagement tactics that we had, uh, primarily leveraging the customer data, as well as the public data sources from social vulnerability indexes, uh, the American Community Survey, as well as the small area health insurance estimates. We spoke to a variety of the advocates in the space um, from each division for uh, SVI, ECS, and SEHI. And we also leverage social determinants of health in the space uh, to partner with a Blue Cross Blue Shield health plan. And in doing so, we've been able to improve some of their engagement tactics, strategy, and analytics. We've been looking into how we derive clinical gaps in care, and then ultimately provide real-time um, information and strategy uh, through business intelligence and reporting. And by doing so, we've been able to see significant improvement in a variety of areas. Specifically, when we look at the numbers, um, looking at July year to date, we've seen that on average for uh, a particular Southwest health plan, uh, averaging 100,000 members plus in the commercial ACA space, we've seen that the average visits have improved up to a, roughly 1,000 unique visits per month, um, meaning that we have roughly 12,000 annual visits translating to utilization over uh, in the double digits. Um, virtual primary care growth uh, from the beginning of the program to now, we've seen a 270% increase. We've seen a high conversion rate as well. Um, so we offer beyond primary care. We've seen conversion rates from behavioral health to primary care. Uh, we've seen a high pa patient satisfaction as well as service utilization. So ultimately what this means is that by leveraging these data-driven um, sources, we've been able to improve the engagement programs, seeing uh, on a month-to-month -month basis a 45% increase on average. Um, when we when we look to empower our patients directly, they have access to a software via mobile application or on the website directly, where they have a dashboard access to schedule their own visits. Uh, they have the ability to define their own profile, upload documentation, provide medical history. They can choose their own visit types, whether that's general medicine, therapy, counseling, psychiatry, or uh, virtual primary care. In doing so, they have the access to um, self-service access to provide uh, health assessment information as well. So by going through the step-by-step -step process of evaluating health screening, emotional wellness, lifestyle, and engagement preferences, we have the ability to essentially uh, collect that information, apply that to the engagement strategy, and schedule a visit uh, directly with those patients. The patient journey, as a result, uh, becomes significantly quicker. Right, so on the bottom screen, you'll see uh, that a new member in Medicare Advantage, for example, typically often takes an entire year, right, to get all their diagnosis covered, uh, their medication prescribed, all the information from a risk adjustment perspective for those who are familiar, right, it takes an entire year from a retrospective perspective to uh, ensure that uh, the scoring is, is correct. Rikiro's primary care ultimately by using technology data-driven sources, as well as virtual um, settings, we're able to speed up that process significantly and be able to provide care uh, a lot sooner. Great work, Daniel and the Rikiro team. Um, we're really impressed with the way you leverage the sprint and the open data you described to enhance your product and improve member engagement. Now I'll hand it over to Sheena to share some of the work that Kept Health did in this sprint. All righty. Hello, everyone. I'm Sheena Franklin, the founder and CEO of Kept Health. We are a digital health AI company focused on helping individuals with chronic skin diseases and health-related skin conditions and their practitioners thrive. In our work, we collect, train, and manage hundreds of data points on a daily basis. And like many of you, we understand the importance and in industry roadblocks regarding health data transparency and privacy patient education. For this top program, we work to address this glaring problem. How do we go from patient concerns, 
lack of transparency of digital health tools and services, and patient knowledge gaps. Two, patients being active participants in solving public health challenges, transparency and willingness of digital health companies to better health outcomes. To create an impactful solution, we spoke with top user advocates, user lies, telehealth, open data, and spoke with digital health founders, city health department leaders, and various patient population groups. This outreach resulted in a five pillar health advocacy campaign framework that can be implemented by key stakeholders focused on the public health concern or patient population impacting their communities. The five pillars include focus, focus on public health concern one at a time, two, communicate, communicate with the interactive user interface, and three, explain, explain how data can be safely used to improve care, four, demonstrate, demonstrate how data is used, and five, partner, partner with digital health companies to utilize a transparency and design API tool. Let's take a look at the framework in action, sponsored by a coalition of state health departments tackling maternal health, designed to empower women to share their health data. Once on the coalition website, a woman can learn more about the facts of maternal health, how sharing her information can change her health outcome, as well as the outcomes of women just like her. And she can hear stories from other women who share her healthcare journey, and she can also share her own story. The site has two key resources for both women and digital health companies. For women, videos that educate and lower the trust barrier to sharing their health data. For example, videos on how data is collected, what a data analyst does with their health data, and how to verify if a company is HIPAA compliant. And for companies, we have created a transparency design API, allowing them to easily share how, why, and when health data is collected on their platform. Please take a moment to visit our demo on the top program page and share your thoughts and ideas with us and let us know how we can help you implement the framework to create a health advocacy campaign for your community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheena. This is a fantastic project and very user-friendly. Um, and I'll also just add that connecting patients and consumers to educational resources about their health is a really important mission, and we're very excited to see where you take this work next. Finally, last but not least, we will hear from SAFE. So over to you, Joel. All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joel Kordiak, Chief Product Officer for SAFE Health. Uh, we are a connected diagnostics platform looking to bring the point of care experience to the home for patients um, to make access to standard care easier. Um, as we worked through the SAFE Top, um, top X uh, sprint, uh, really we focused on utilizing the the uh, social determinants health data set and for solving the problem statement of enabling access to diagnostic testing in healthcare platforms. And really with an emphasis on configurations to support underserved populations who lack access to quality care. Through this experience, really we identified five major themes um, as we assess the data. And really those themes went into these buckets of access for high risk patients, personalized care plans, delivery and access, financial assistance, and educational and resources. When we looked at the holistic elements of these elements tied together, we really identified that the key message was to how can we bring accessibility through a platform that we can configure to be usable in different use cases. Additionally, as we talked to the advocates within the, uh, within the program, um, we want to thank Dr. Deline and, and May, um, who really helped us identify, I guess, uh, three additional topics of trust. As we're talking to these different user experiences and different groups, trust was a key thing. Is my data going to be secure in the system? Is my data 
going to be um, utilized? Am I talking to somebody that I know? Am I talking to somebody that um, I recognize? Is it user-friendly? Is the information and the user experience going to be easy to use? And one, from a privacy standpoint, how do I make sure that what I'm going through is secure? All of these things, when we looked at the overall experience, were critical to understanding that um, a user experience is more than just a piece of technology. It is a way to allow somebody to come in to get help. And to do that, as a first thing, we must, we must first build trust, a user-friendly experience, and make sure it's secure. With that said, let's go and look at a, a prototype of the overall user experience. So within the Safe Health platform, the, the experience is 100% configurable. We are a white-labeled platform that is used for both uh, B2C as well as uh, B2B 2C experiences. And the idea is as we configure our platform, we are able to customize all aspects of the content to meet user needs. This is critical in building that trust in establishing the different um, use cases that are needed to go through and be successful in the experience. As we look at the dashboard, this is the first part in where we define content that can be uh, supporting of user experiences, um, access to your healthcare records, and ordering tests, and all the elements you would need to get that point of care experience at home. All the graphics you see on the home screen here from the logo, colors, images are completely configurable. And be it if you are working with somebody in uh, the Choctaw Nation or into rural New York, um, we can configure this experience to be directly related to that experience, to what that user is expecting to see, to help build that trust. Next, as we go through and look at what our experience offers, through the application, we use health services through our what we call our care automation engine. And this is a process by which we developed end-to-end -end clinical protocols that are focused on bringing, bringing care to the home and, repre and representing that point of care experience at the home. In this experience, we can, we can configure virtual consults where we can do uh, assessments of medical necessity to help screen and assess initial qu content to make sure somebody is right to receive that telehealth experience, making it very easy for them to get that uh, care. Next, we can do diagnostic tests where we offer diagnostic tests, um, uh, return to lab tests, or even point of care experience scheduling so that somebody can um, get that holistic view and a provider can receive that information on the backside to assess their, um, their condition. Um, additionally, we're able to collect insurance so that based off of that insurance or benefit need, we can have employer benefits or insurance use cases to help facilitate costs and ultimately procure that test and package with a telehealth experience. Next, after we register a test, we're able to go through and utilize the test in context of um, a clinical consult, which we then go through to help work with finding a clinician and conduct that telehealth experience. Altogether, through the mobile application, we're able to make this a seamless experience, which then um, brings everybody together to provide that end-to-end -end care. Um, we thank you um, for the opportunity and then can give that feedback to end the session. Thank you for having us, and it was a great opportunity to meet with the TopX team and to participate. Thank you so much, Joel. This is a really impressive and accessible digital health platform, and we really appreciate your attention to the user advocates' recommendations about serving underserved populations. So thank you again to the SAFE team for this excellent presentation. With that, we've concluded today's lightning talks. Congratulations to all of these teams, as well as the others who participated in the sprint. We're all eager to see what happens next with these impressive tools supporting patient and community health. I will now, now ha hand it over to my colleague, Dominika Zhu, to introduce a community reactions discussion about the challenges of improving the quality and utility of diagnostic data to improve health. Hi everyone, my name is Dominique Zhu and I am the Head of Human-Centered Innovation at Census Open Innovation Labs. Welcome to the Community Reactions segment, we are, where we'll hear from community experts about their take on these products. I am joined by four wonderful user advocates from the Sprints who will speak more about how the tools we've just heard about will impact their communities and others. As user advocates, they represent the perspectives of end users affected by these issues and have each offered insights and support to the tech teams to help ground their solutions and community wisdom and realistic avenues for adoption and impact. 
Please join me in this lightning round discussion to hear how we can translate these tools into real change. David, Gwen, JR, and Luke, we're so happy to have you here. Welcome. We'll first start with Gwen. Hi, Gwen. So Gwen Darian is the Executive Vice President for Patient Advocacy, Engagement, and Education at National Patient Advocate Foundation. A three-time cancer survivor herself, she is a longtime patient advocate who has held leadership roles in some of the country's preeminent nonprofit organizations. In her current role, Gwen leads programs that link patient advocate foundations' direct patient service programs to NPAF system change initiatives with the goal of improving access to affordable, equitable, quality health care. Welcome, Gwen. Thank Gwen. you um, so much. I'm really pleased to be here, and I was really pleased to be a user advocate for this, this um, important project and timely project. We're so lucky to have had you part of our whole entire sprint. So as a longtime patient advocate, how do you feel that these tools can encourage patients to feel comfortable sharing their health data? So I think just I want to take a little bit of a step back from that question, which is that um, in order to ensure that that patients find benefit and patients feel safe in sharing, you have to first of all look at the look at the context. But I think you start with ensuring that stakeholders include patients and communities and voices to inform what's really important to patients and also elucidate what the barriers are to um, some of the some of the ways that they feel about using these. Um, I, you know, when I was listening to the presentation, how they feel about using these tools and how they feel about participating in um, participating in the kind of collection of research and, and data to inform community benefit. So when I was listening to the presentations, the one that with um, probably unsurprisingly really resonated with me the most was the Community Connect Labs, where um, there was a process of bringing in communities, bringing in feedback, using community workers, community health workers to really um, to really make that connection to people. Um, and so I was really, I, and in many of the other presentations, there was some, there was certainly an explicit desire to improve outcomes for patients, but it wasn't explicit how patient and community um, and consumers had been had been um, had been involved in informing how these tools tools were developed. Um, I think the other issue that is really important is, is to think about the context. And I know, you know, I was at another meeting where somebody said they have a boil the ocean suggestion, and this is maybe a little bit of a boil the ocean suggestion, but I think we don't understand what the context is, particularly as we're looking at um, promoting health equity, as we're looking at creating safe spaces for sharing, um, sharing sensitive information. We won't get, those tools will never be adopted. And the projects will never be adopted. And I'll say I had an experience um, just yesterday. I was filling out a survey that was supposed to be anonymous. Um, I mean, it, it, they claimed it was anonymous, and it was about some sensitive issues around um, around bias and and racism. And I actually declined to answer the racial identity question because I'm sure that I my my identity is a Middle Eastern woman and Middle Eastern uh, you know, first generation, and I was sure that they that I could be identified just by putting that. Um, put it, checking off that box. So I put declined to answer, um, which I've never done before. But, you know, there are, um, there is this context there. Um, I think the, um, I'm sorry, am I just going on too long? <laughs> no worries. Well, we'd love to hear actually on it. We love your, we love the candidness. And I think it's so, yeah. so needed to really make sure that these tools will become you know, useful to the end user. Uh, would love to hear from your point of view what you actually see as potential benefits um, from the tools that you've worked on. Well, I really love the the, con the really thinking about it within the context of community benefit and involving people because there's a benefit to the community rather than just simply collecting data for the sake of collecting data or data for the sake of informing a healthcare system that doesn't involve, involve the patients. So one of the things I noticed in some of the presentations was that there was a lot of, so the healthcare provider can make decisions. This is not how patients inter want to interact with the healthcare system. Um, 
And with our patients that we serve, I would say a good 85% want to be involved in shared decision-making and a few on each each end want to either be entirely directing their decisions and some want um, their healthcare providers to do do that and we, um, to make the decisions for them. And we serve a very, um, we serve a population that is historically marginalized, that is, um, that is, that is impacted by many social determinants of health. So I think that's a really, that's a really important thing to always think about. Um, and I think the other thing is to throw out assumptions and kind of look at everything, listen carefully and look at everything and hear everything with, with a new perspective. So um, we used to always, you know, we used to talk about the digital divide, which we know is there, but having done, just done three workshops in communities, very different communities, pri- um, primarily with Black patients with cancer, one in the Mississippi Delta, one in Richmond, Virginia, and one in South Central LA, all of these patients had, all of these people had smartphones and almost all of them used patient portals. So that's just an example of an assumption that we make that if we can throw out that assumption, it'll help us determine what, um, it'll help us determine how to build these things. So I think that's, you know, I think in many ways, that's one of the, one of the things that I try really hard to do. And it's really difficult to throw out your preconceived assumptions. It's really difficult to do a different thing. But it is the way that it's what's going to make this relevant and it's what's going to make um, these projects have an impact. Thank you so much, Gwen. Um, I think you already covered all my questions. So this is fantastic. (laughs) Really, really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Luke, um, hi. Great to have you here uh, for the audience. For the audience, Luke Short is the director of the Public Health Laboratory at Dallas County Health and Human Services with a diverse professional background in public health, forensic sciences, and analytical chemistry. His career spans various roles within state, federal, and private sectors, underscoring his commitment to using reliable testing methods to enhance community health efforts. Hi, Luke. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. And and that was a very fascinating conversation we just had. And I think a lot of these questions for a lot of the panelists here We'll all be um, itching to answer all of those. Uh, very fascinating. I, I think to sort of step upon that and go one step further, I would say, especially because of what we've seen with AI um, sort of growing within um, the world marketplace and the world support structure socially, as well as technolo- technologically, um, we've seen a dramatic shift in what we can do, as well as the concerns about privacy and how it's being handled. Um, to, to throw in a small uh, sort of story to that, I've been on many calls recently within um, uh, public health forums where you'll have people gather, and as soon as they see an AI system come up, uh, they immediately pull. And um, there's already some pushback against uh, AI sort of going into what has traditionally been a human endeavor. So that'll be interesting to see. But (laughs) thank you again for having me. Absolutely. So in your day-to-day life, you direct a public health laboratory. So you think about testing data a lot. What do you think uh, should be the top considerations for teams and others working on solutions to improve the collection of data from IVDs in order to best support community health efforts? Thank you, and that's a very good point. I would say that it is extremely varied depending upon the sources of data that we look at, whether you're talking about clinical data, uh, data coming in through the hospitals or through um, another kind of collection initiatives that you see where people go out on the streets to collect data, And all of that really is to support our community health needs assessment, uh, which is to better strengthen and support the public health of the community we're in. Um, I would say that the top considerations for teams to improve data collection from IVDs and better in general support community health efforts as a result would be one of three. First one being data harmonization, that is to ensure consistency in data interpretation across multiple different systems. Um, Second point being community engagement, you know, utilizing user-friendly platforms to enhance data collection uh, efficacy from diverse communities, as was mentioned in the prior discussion about understanding what's the technological basis as well as the understanding of your group that you're looking at um, and being able to engage with that technology. And finally, third, the other big one is, of course, consumer privacy, maintaining data privacy while providing vital diagnostic information and being able to shape policy for the uh, region that you look over. Thank you, Luke. 
And I, I guess I'll combine the next two questions if that's okay. What are some meaningful aspects of these tools that can help address some of the gaps that you, you're seeing in your field? And what would you like to see as ideal next steps? Sure, I, I would say the meaningful aspects of these tools to address various gaps would be, first of all, the holistic data view. Uh, tools uh, like we saw in the presentations from Aerospike's Health Feature Store provided a nice comprehensive view of patient data across various healthcare settings as well as also social determinants integration using things like the API by social determinants indexing or cloud link technologies, which would enhance the uh, diagnostic accuracy of the tests. Um, and I would like to say that I would see as the ideal next steps for these products to be scalability, interoperability, um, you know, ensuring seamless integration with existing systems and scalability to cater to growing data volumes. As we know, um, more data is better and the challenge is really being able to navigate that data and project it in a way that better understands the uh, direction your community is going, as well as community-oriented development for the groups to further their engagement with diverse communities um, that you're supporting to tailor data collection tools to the unique needs. And finally, something near and dear to me working within the um, clinical testing facilities, uh, regulatory compliance, uh, whereby the groups can adhere to regulatory standards and then very importantly, ethical guidelines that underpin those standards, ensuring consumer data privacy and rights. Thank you so much, Luke. I saw a lot of head nodding as you were speaking, so I think we're, we're on very similar pages. Thank you so much for your time with us. David, we'll now move on to you. Um, David Schleifer is the Director of Research at Public Agenda, a national research to action organization that digs deep into the key challenges facing our democracy to uncover insights and solutions. He uses qualitative and survey research to understand people's attitudes and behaviors in health, education, and civic engagement. He has done research specifically on low-income parents, receptivity to dis discussing social determinants of health with their children's pediatrician. Awesome. It's great to have you here, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. To start off, um, you've done research about the challenges of collecting data regarding social determinants of health, among other topics. What do you think is most important for teams who are incorporating community-level data about social determinants of health into their products? Yeah, so I think I'm going to pick up on on some of the themes that the other panelists have mentioned, and that has to do with the risks of data collection from the perspective of um, of patients or families. And so, um, in some of the research that I did with the United Hospital Fund with low income parents about their views on being screened um, for social determinants of health in a pediatric care setting. Um, the risks were very real. I think we tend to think of data risks in terms of big data breaches, but uh, for the the people that we spoke to, um, the risks were that uh, you know they they were afraid that someone was going to call child welfare on them. Um, they were afraid that they could lose custody of their children, um, and they were afraid of being discriminated against um, in even more so than they already experienced with the healthcare system. But you know th those risks of um, you know like people being um harmed instead of helped from data are, are are very real for people and really people talked about seeing those those types of things happen to friends and neighbors so um it's not just a theoretical risk for people so i would say with that in mind that i think the idea of um collecting data at a community level um, is actually really promising because instead of, first of all, instead of in the clinical workflow, having to ask screen every patient individually, there's the potential to think broader, both about, um, you know, social needs in a, at a community level, um, and then potentially to address those needs at a community level, instead of necessarily, um, spending the time going patient to patient and also, um, you know, potentially making patients feel that they are at risk if they disclose sensitive information. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that information. Although I know it's, it's sensitive and we, we definitely understand that. Um, what are some aspects you'd like to see given, given your lived experience and professional experience, um, some aspects you'd like to see incorporated into the further implementation of these tools as it pertains to the end user? I mean, I think one thing is that, um, and again, I'm, I'm, you know, this is some from the from what we've heard from um, participants in in our research uh, is that you know 
communities have assets and communities have skills and communities um, know what they need and they know what their challenges are, but, but, and they also, you know, they, they, um, you know, they, they have assets, right? Like they're, they're not, um, I think it's very common to look at communities as completely lacking. Um, and we know that that's not true. So I think, you know, thinking about, I, I don't know if this is an answer so much to what needs to be implement, incorporated into the tools per se. Uh, but I think that, you know, there's, um, when we think about problem solving, um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's easy to think about interventions coming down from above. And I think there's tremendous value in um, investing in communities in ways that um, allow them to address their needs in ways that they know are going to work for them. Yes, absolutely. Again, a lot of head nodding. So we yeah. all agree. Um, last question. How do you think, how do you feel that to- these tools can benefit or be relevant to the communities we work with? Anything else you'd like to add there? Yeah, I think the the, the thing that I would just um, suggest is that um, there, so there's a, a wonderful book called The Political Determinants of Health by Daniel Dawes from um, Morehouse School of Medicine. And, you know, I, I, I encourage folks to read it, but I think, you know, he is challenging us to shift from thinking of these of social de- determinants of health at an individual level to the political and policy dynamics um, that um, that result in communities having 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 the types of needs that that I think we've been talking about today. So I think you know shifting towards a perspective on not just helping individual people, but but helping communities grow and thrive, um, and and thinking about the policies and and the politics that are needed to make that happen. I think that's a a, a, sh- a bigger picture shift that I think these tools can help lead to. I don't think the tools themselves are, are, I think they're, they're a great step. And I, I think, but, you know, I think the bigger picture is what are the the policy solutions? Absolutely. Those are very, very wise words to end with and invite us into further action on a bigger level. So thank you so much, David, for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Of course. And JR, not, last but not least, for the audience, uh, JR Denson is a program manager at American University. His current role and past roles involve many of the responsibilities of a patient navigator, walking people through health insurance, what's available, how it works, and what may be, be the best options. He's also a practicing EMT with several years of experience in direct medical care. Before joining American University, JR served as a legislative fellow in the U.S. House of Representatives and as a public health official for the D.C. government. It's great to have you here, JR. Good to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. So you've been involved in the Opportunity Project for several years now. What has stood out to you in this year's sprints that has been a great takeaway for you? Yeah, I think Tom kind of got away from me. I had to start counting. I think it's almost four, maybe, uh, as a user advocate. Uh, and in that time, one of the things that really stood out this year, and maybe this is going to sound cheesy, maybe not, uh, but th- this uh, particular sprint, what stood out, one of the things that stood out was the genuine enthusiasm from so many of the groups that I worked with, uh, specifically. Um, <clears throat> David beat me to the punch. You can't be in D.C. and not talk about politics at least a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he referenced it for me. Uh, but uh, similar to the, you know, the famous quote, all politics is local. Uh, I believe that all health is personal. And so I really appreciated that so many of the groups working on uh, the um, uh, projects related to health specifically were didn't just have a professional interest in what they were working on, but also a personal interest. And I really believe that makes a very meaningful difference when you're doing these kinds of projects. 100%. Thank you, JR. Um, in your point of view, how can solutions like those presented in this year's sprint help bridge some of the gaps that you see present in the communities that you work with? Um, I think, uh, so I think, I believe both, uh, I think everyone before me, I think leading with Gwen said something similar and it's probably not a coincidence that there's some common themes here, uh, but, uh, the, a one size fits all approach isn't necessarily the best, um, for, for everyone. And so I, I know other folks have mentioned this. And so this kind of 
uh, recognizing that variability is important and whatever specific specific demographic you're working with, making sure you have some variability there. And so a lot of teams really did that. They did their due diligence and making sure that if the end user is a data scientist or a program analyst at a federal agency, that they really thought about talking to the folks that talking to those end users and making sure that the, the what they were building fit that group versus those who are maybe working with uh, a single parent with two jobs who has a chronically sick child, you know, the, the kind of deliverable that they need is going to be vastly different. And I think the, the teams really took that seriously. Wonderful. That's really great feedback. Um, last question for you. Given your experience in health policy and education, how do you think digital health platforms like those created in the sprint can be best deployed to benefit as many end users as possible? And what are aspects of adoption that teams should really keep in mind? Hmm. I hope this doesn't sound like cheating, uh, but I, I really think um, the answer to this one is, is pretty similar to the last one um, in that it's important to... Um, keep in mind the keep variability in mind uh and focusing on the specific group that you're working with so um uh i uh i, I hate to ramble but I, I do think that they're very similar in that way and uh the panels before me did a really good job of also supplementing that so yes Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, JR. Thanks for joining TOP for so many years. My pleasure. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you all so much for your incredible work and insights to help make these products possible. We've learned so much from each and every one of you and all of our user advocates in all of these sprints. Back to you, Drew. Thank you so much, Dominica and panel. Uh, it's wonderful to hear from you all, and thank you so much for all that you've done in the sprint this year. In the top community, we really greatly value human-centered design, and we're so thankful for the contributions that you as user advocates have made to uh, the sprint and these products. And we thank you for your candid reactions and reflections on where these products go next to truly make an impact on health. Well, that was the final session in today's showcase, and what a jam-packed afternoon it was. Thank you to today's speakers and everyone who tuned in. Please stick around for another just a few moments as we close out the showcase with acknowledgements and information on how to get involved in upcoming initiatives from the Census Bureau. I'm so happy to step in now and have the wonderful job of thanking the incredible people who worked on this sprint and showcase. First, a major thank you to Thera Neyman, our FDA Sprint Organizer and Innovation Program Manager, who is responsible for all aspects of this sprint for our team at the Census Bureau, and to Haley Ashkal miller who you heard from today, uh, top director, and thank you so much for all your work on this effort. I also want to thank the rest of the COIL team, Census Open Innovation Labs, for their work on the showcase and the sprint. Dominique Zhu, who we just heard from in the community reactions panel, as well as Alexandra Barker behind the scenes. And a very special shout out to the incredible branding and visual design work done by our digital team, which is comprised of Alessandra Harkop, Dorcas Lynn, Vanessa Yip, and Sadie J. We also could not do this event without the incredible work of Mike Morgan and Ventana Productions. So thank you to you all and to the Census Bureau and FDA leadership and support teams at both agencies for many hours of paperwork and troubleshooting, which made our partnership possible. From the FDA side, we are so grateful to Sarah Brenner for your leadership, as well as Sammy, Pooja, and Hiba, who we heard from today, and the entire FDA team for your tireless work to make the sprint a success this past year. And most importantly, we of course congratulate all the teams and participants in the sprint who actually did all the incredible work to create these products, including the tech teams, user advocates, data stewards, advisors, and more. Now I'll pass the mic back to Haley. 
Thank you so much, Drew. And we also must thank you for your fantastic leadership over our team. As we conclude today's fantastic showcase, we urge you to stay involved with the Opportunity Project and the array of important topics we are focusing on this year. We are currently in the middle of seven other technology development sprints on topics including access to capital in Indigenous communities, funding entrepreneurship in Puerto Rico, promoting competition in the credit card market, and many more. Please visit opportunity.census.gov to view all the topics. If you're interested to see the results, please save the date for our annual virtual conference, January 17th through the 19th, 2024. We will be showcasing all of the results of this year's work and much more at our annual three-day virtual summit. These events are always packed with speakers and interactive learning opportunities, and we hope to see you there. There will also be plenty of opportunities to get involved next year. We encourage you to subscribe to emails or send us an interest note at opportunity.census.gov. If you're a federal agency, we would love to talk to you about hosting your own sprint. If you're from industry, academia, local government, or the nonprofit sector, we invite you to join any of our sprints in 2024. We will announce the topics in late spring. But please feel free to reach out sooner if you'd like to learn more in the meantime. And if you're just a data lover, sign up for emails from top to stay in the loop too. Thank you again for celebrating the work of our collaboration with FDA on diagnostic data, and we cannot wait to see you virtually in January to collaborate with you further.